Erica Beck, she's right there, uh, from Channel Islands. Welcome, President Beck. Uh, on behalf of all my board colleagues, we want to welcome you. We're so looking forward to working with you. Um, I also want to uh, say a few words before we begin our committee work about our public speaker practices. Uh, you know, at the front of our agenda, we have a piece of paper that talks about public speakers. And it's a little bit like the instructions in the airlines, you know, that sit in your seat back pocket. And we know it's there and we know what it says, we think. But I thought it would be a good idea to review it just briefly. Uh, you know, we welcome public speakers to our meetings because they provide information uh, to the board that helps us do our work. And they are uh, permitted to address the board in two ways, both uh, orally and if they have written materials, uh, those two would be distributed to us. Uh, there are two parts of our agenda where you'll see uh, public speakers addressing the board. One is if they have a very specific uh, agenda item that they wish to discuss, they can uh, sign up to address us with respect to that agenda item. And then if they have a general uh, comment about university-related uh, issues, they can address us in our plenary session. Um, we only have two restrictions with respect to public speakers. One is that uh, the intent is to uh, benefit the board by providing us information, and we truly do benefit from the information that we receive from public speakers. Uh, but it's not a forum to air individual grievances, obviously, or to uh, discuss matters that are uh, the subject of a collectively bargained uh, issue. Uh, and the only other restriction we have is on time. And uh, what we do is try to be sure that every speaker has an opportunity to speak, uh, that we have an opportunity to hear every speaker, uh, and therefore, we allocate uh, time to each speaker and we try to uh, make sure folks stick with it because it respects the uh, rights of the other speakers to address us and it respects our time as a board to attend to the rest of our agenda. Uh, I just wanted to bring this all up because I don't think often enough uh, the board expresses their thanks to the public speakers. Uh, they do uh, help us do our work. Uh, we are always impressed with how thoughtful and uh, uh, prepared uh, the public speakers are when they come to our meetings. And I just wanted to spend, a, uh, I think I actually got in under three minutes. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to spend that time to thank them. Um, so now we will turn to our committee work. Uh, Trustee Kim Bell, could you please co convene the Committee on Ed Policy? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Eisen. Will the Committee on Educational Policy please come to order? We will now invite public comment preceding the educational policy agenda items. We have four speakers today. Jennifer Egan, Molly Talcott, Jonathan Karp, Kevin Weir, and William Blischke. We have one item on today's consent agenda, approval of the minutes from the July 2016 meeting. If there are no objections, the minutes are approved. The committee has two items on today's discussion agenda. Item one is an information item regarding research, scholarship, and creative activities. The item will be presented by Lauren Blanchard, Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, and Ganesh Rahman, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research. Dr. Blanchard, please begin. Do we want to be, uh, acknowledge before, the speakers? Be, be, before we begin that, oh. we probably need to call the speakers. Sorry, public speakers. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Egan, president of the California Faculty Association. I'm also a professor of philosophy and public policy and administration at Cal State East Bay. We have one academic year between our contracts. What do we want to do with our peacetime? Uh, the point of peacetime is to create more of it and to do the work that lays the foundation to resolve future conflicts. And now we know these conflicts will come but establishing relationships between now and then will help. 
We welcome this time and hope that the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees will work with CFA on matters that concern all of us. First and most importantly, we need to get more money into the system from the governor and the legislature in order to keep our university public. We hope that no one in this room has given up on the public character of the People's University and the state's responsibility to fund the system. We all need to remain committed to securing public funding for the CSU. First, the first and most immediate step is passing Prop 55 so we don't fall off a cliff again. And going forward, I hope that we are able to lobby together as a unified front from funding for the legislature mm. and even explore other dedicated sources of public funding for the CSU. Secondly, we need to have serious conversations about academic freedom and intellectual property. I am hopeful that those will take place this year prior to any policy emanating from the chancellor's office and, and that concerns over risk management enforced codes of civility and desires for administrative flexibility will not override your commitment to genuine shared governance processes. Next, we need to work together to increase tenure density and honor the work of all faculty. We're at 40% tenure density by headcount, and I think that's criminal. It's not fair to lecture faculty, to tenure line faculty, and most of all, it's not fair to students. <clears throat> Our lecturers are qualified and very good at what they do, this two-tier system hurts the reputation of our university and undermines our commitment to serve students. I hope that we can work together on this issue uh, along with members of the Academic Senate and come up with some concrete goals and creative solutions. Lastly, we need to have a serious discussion about who our students are and whether or not the current fads in public policy are going to serve them. We are concerned that policies coming from the governor and legislature, perhaps well-intentioned, demonstrate a misunderstanding of who CSU students are what they need to, and what they need to succeed. CSU students are hardworking people with many responsibilities who required support tailored to their real needs. This year, CFA will be examining their stories and analyzing these current trends and whether these policies really support their success. This is a critical discussion we must have before we send too many precious dollars down a misguided rabbit hole. We invite you to be part of this frank and important discussion of who our students are and what kinds of public policies will generally serve them. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Molly Talcott. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Cal State LA and secretary of CFA. I also have the pleasure to teach classes in Latin American studies. And when I do so, I witness students lighting up and coming alive as they learn about the diasporas and social histories that have shaped their families, formed their own identities, and that help them to better understand and feel empowered within their own communities. It's beautiful to behold students developing their own self-understandings alongside a broader understanding of history, politics, and social life. Many of us who teach in ethnic and gender studies can provide inspiring anecdotes about the undeniable benefits of ethnic studies for our students in the CSU. And now we have more than anecdotes to substantiate our pedagogical intuitions. A new study by Stanford University researchers has found that taking ethnic studies improves students' academic performance and discourages them from dropping out. And the effects on academic performance were not only limited to their ethnic studies classes. In fact, the largest gains for students taking those classes were found among boys and among Latinos in the subjects of science and math. <clears throat> at Cal State LA, my MA student, Uriel Serrano, who's heading for his PhD in a week at Santa Cruz, um, led the Men of Color Success Network. And out of that work came his research on the experiences of black and Latino men students at Cal State LA. He compiled compelling data of men detailing their experiences of everyday racism on campus and their search for a refuge, which they often found in the Pan-African Studies Department. And many noted that had that department not been their lifeline, they would no longer be at Cal State LA. Given the testimonies of students right here in this room at prior meetings in support of expanding ethnic studies, given the hunger strike at SFSU last spring in protest to the cuts to the College of Ethnic Studies, given the massive walkouts last year at my campus led by the Black Student Union, 
And given the dire racial crisis this country is facing in politics, in policing, in immigration enforcement, the Ethnic Studies Task Force request for the Chancellor's Office to fund 50 tenure line faculty in ethnic studies, just two, about two per campus, is a modest proposal. And it was a missed opportunity to not endorse that proposal. With the passage and signing of AB 2016, ethnic studies will become ubiquitous in California high schools and middle schools, and the CSU will be scrambling to catch up. And so if for no other reason than to train future K through 12 ethnic studies teachers who enroll in the CSU, uh, the, the CSU should at the very least fund those hires. Um, in closing, I just wanna quote the graduation initiative webpage. Quote, we face a moral imperative to serve our students better by helping more of them complete college educations and prepare for full productive lives. I agree with this and so does CFA. We do have a moral imperative and we know through research more and more that we, it's time to change course um, and prepare students to engage meaningfully in a confusing, unequal, and divided world with wisdom, intellectual acumen, and emotional resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. That was a tough act to follow. Uh, good morning. I'm Kevin Weir, professor of sociology at CSU Sacramento and chair of the bargaining team for CFA. I'm pleased to come before you today to report that the implementation of the contract we agreed to last spring is going well. Faculty have been surprised and gratifi gratified that the raises were processed quickly after July 1st and turned up in their pocketbooks the very next pay period. We would like to acknowledge and praise the good work of your staff and their communications with the State Controller's Office. I'm also glad to report that negotiations on one outstanding piece of the contract, range elevation for lecturers, is moving forward. We seem to have substantial agreement on the character of the problem and approaches to the solution. We know that some campus presidents and administrators are as eager as we are to resolve this problem so as to have clear, consistent pathways for long-term employees to move up in range. As you may recall, last spring we agreed that we, should we be unable to reach an agreement through bargaining, the issue will go to binding arbitration for guaranteed implementation in fall of 2017. Time is of the essence in order for this to work. We must reach an agreement by this coming March or the arbitrator will make the decision for us. There is enough time to get this done, but we need help from all of you campus presidents. In order to make reasonable and informed decisions about fixing the range elevation process, we need reliable data. We have some data from about 11, I believe it is 11 of the 23 campuses. The quality of this data, however, is disappointing at best. Lecturers make up 45% of the faculty by FTE and 60% by headcount. <sighs> we would hope that faculty affairs and human resources on the campuses would be able to keep better track of such a large number of faculty. We hope that the campus presidents will do everything they can to help us solve this issue at the bargaining table instead of making us go through the costly and time-consuming process of arbitration. Please work with us on the campuses to get information to the system so that we can continue to enjoy and extend this period of collegial problem solving and cooperation. I thank you in advance. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm Bill Blischke. I uh, spent 45 years as an administrator and faculty member at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I'm currently the president of CSU Emeriti and Retired Faculty Association. Tomorrow morning uh, at a time certain at 8.30, I'm gonna talk about two very positive things that CSU IRFA is doing in the system. But I wanted to comment on an article. I live in Torrance, not far from here, and our local newspaper is called The Daily Breeze. There was an article on the 29th of August. It had a nice headline, CSU looks to boost its lagging four-year graduation rates. Great. The first sentence says, the concept of a, in quotes, four-year university, at least at Cal State University campuses, has long been something of a polite fiction for many students. That really irritated me. I was going to write a letter to the editor, but they restrict that to 150 words and I couldn't say what needed to be said in 150 words, being an academic and this being a complex issue. 
but they also have what they call, I never realized this, what they call guest commentaries. I thought those are people they hired, but anybody can submit a guest commentary, and that can be 600 words. So I wrote a 595-word rebuttal, and I submitted it, and they asked for your email address and your phone number. They never published it and never got back to me to explain why. So I resubmitted it last Thursday or Friday. Maybe they will include, because they talked about what you're doing to change this. They didn't talk about the demographic characteristics of our students, that they're older, many are married, all the budget cuts we've had in classes, uh, and you know all the other, and the tuition increases means they have to work two or three jobs. They didn't explain why 6%, for example, of Dominguez Hill students, only 6% of Dominguez Hills and, and Cal State LA students graduate in four years. And the average for the whole system, I think, is 16%. I'm glad you're doing something about it, but I have copies of that um, article and my rebuttal to it. Hopefully, it'll be in the paper after I resubmitted it again a couple days ago. But I'd like you to be able to see it, so I have copies of their article and of my guest commentary. Thank you. So, um, are we, we're, we, I think we have all the speakers. Jonathan Karp isn't here today. Passing. All right. Very well. Um, so back again to item one, which is an information item regarding research, scholarship, creative activities, um, which will be presented by Lauren Blanchard and Ganesh Raman. I'm Dr. Blanchard now. Please begin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair Kim Bell, and also special thanks to each of the speakers this morning for your remarks, uh, and good morning to all of you. Um, as you know, teaching, learning, and student success form the core of the CSU mission. Today, we want to share with you how faculty research, scholarship, and creative activities support our core mission. First, CSU is a leader in student research, both undergraduate and graduate. Student involvement in research is exciting and really creates opportunities to learn cutting-edge skills. Second, faculty involvement in research, scholarship, and creative activities keeps faculty on the cutting edge within their respective disciplines. Third, faculty research, scholarship, and creative activities provide substantial external funding from grants, contracts, and fellowships that enhances the quality of our programs. And lastly, faculty and student research are often applied to real world issues and contributes to solutions for our communities, our state, and our region. Dr. Ganesh Raman, Vice Chan Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research, will now present the item on research. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Blanchard. As we embark on our second phase of the graduation initiative, we maintain our commitment to the quality and rigor of our students' educational experience and the value of their degrees. A key strategy for fulfilling our commitment to academic quality and rigor is through the research scholarship and creative activities of our faculty. This presentation will showcase some examples of the outstanding faculty research scholarship and creative activities that benefit our students and solve problems for our communities. The Shared Expertise Initiatives, Facilities, and Resources of the 23 CSU campuses address the needs of California communities. And this is one of the CSU strengths, applied research that addresses these local and state needs. From the perspectives of many disciplines, our faculty respond to problems such as environmental concerns about our coast and oceans, sustaining our agricultural economy in the face of the ongoing drought, and improving health and well-being in our communities. 
external research funding enables the CSU to recruit and retain top tier faculty who with their students stimulate innovation, taking faculty to the leading edge of their fields and keeping CSU curricula at the forefront of the disciplines. For example, Dr. Chung Ming Kang, Associate Professor of Microbiology at CSU Stanislaus, conducts research that reduces agricultural costs and speeds the production of livestock feed, boosting agricultural production in the Central Valley and beyond. This chart shows the many ways in which our faculty are successful at winning prestigious grant awards from external sources. In 2014-15, the total grant and contract revenue for the CSU system was over $567 million. These are not general funds used for basic university operations. Instead, our faculty compete for these external funds and the awards are used for specific innovative projects that enable our faculty and students to undertake exciting groundbreaking research that benefits local communities and that prepares our students for 21st century careers. The BUILD grants are one example. The National Institutes of Health awarded over $60 million in grant funding for programs focused on traditionally underserved students at three CSU campuses, Long Beach, Northridge, and San Francisco. The Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity, or BUILD grants, provide funding for mentoring underrepresented students in science, undergraduate research, and preparation for biomedical research careers. Research grants like these serve many purposes simultaneously, responding to community needs, augmenting existing student success efforts, increasing greater student engagement, closing the achievement gap, and supporting faculty excellence. Research scholarship and creative activities provide an effective strategy for improving student success. As we hear from these students at CSU Channel Islands, you will see that participation in research and scholarship increases student engagement and success in their chosen discipline. Please start the video. I am going to Oregon State University to pursue a PhD in analytical chemistry. Um, for me, I will be continuing to do my research, presenting at more conferences, hopefully getting more fellowships, and after that, uh, earning my PhD and becoming a research scientist. Uh, I'm planning to continue uh, working on my research with uh, Dr. Jeff Gu, a mathematician here at Ch uh, Channel Islands, um, and, and, and seeing where we can take that. I'm hoping to present at a few more conferences, so I'll be working with a mentor uh, to be able to do that over the next year. I am looking forward to attending more conferences this year and becoming much more active and involved inside my research. Uh, yeah, so I was accepted to the Mexican American Studies uh, program at San Jose State. Next semester, I'll be doing uh, more research. Uh, this time, I'll be doing it in conjunction with a professor. We're working together on a collaborative process to write a paper. At another campus, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Professor Jordi Puj Suari co-invented CubeSat, a technology breakthrough which has become a worldwide standard for low-cost space access and aids education and space exploration. Before CubeSat, satellites were the size of a school bus and cost $500 million to manufacture. Pooj Suari's breakthrough was to miniaturize satellites as small as four inches cubed, weighing just three pounds. As part of CubeSat, students at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo work in multidisciplinary teams with NASA to design, build, and launch these small satellites to orbit on U.S. and Russian rockets for under $50,000. As with scholarship, creative activities also 
undergo peer evaluation, can qualify for funding from nationally competitive grants, may be used in scholarly conferences and journals, and have specific criteria for faculty tenure and promotion. This photo shows a CSU Northridge musical funded by a National Endowment for the Arts Research Grant. The production, Joining the Spectrum, demonstrated the transformative potential of theater as positive intervention for youth on the autism spectrum. Improvements in self-esteem and relationship skills were noted as benefits. In this presentation, we have given just a glimpse into research scholarship and creative activities in the CSU. We, rec we recognize it's impossible in such a brief presentation to capture the entire depth, breadth, quality, or impact of this aspect of university life. More stories are highlighted in the brochure, which is included in your board packets. With this publication, we will continue our work to raise the profile of CSU research, scholarship, and creative activities, and to provide to stakeholders a glimpse into the considerable talent that our students and faculty display in their contributions, and into the academic quality generated by their efforts. Dr. Blanchard. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman. Uh, I'd like to turn now to President Les Wong, who will tell us a bit more about the National Institutes of Health's BUILD grant at San Francisco State University. Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard. Um, San Francisco State was awarded $17 million to address issues of workforce diversity in biomedical research. San Francisco State was one of three CSUs, including Long Beach and Northridge, to receive the BUILD grant, which resulted in NIH awarding over $60 million to the CSU. And the CSU has received 30% of BUILD grants given across the entire United States. Capitalizing on SF State's strength and diversity, and its history as a re university renowned for scientific teaching, research training, and community engagement, the BUILD project has four broad goals. First, to increase the persistence of underrepresented students and their skills for biomedical research. Second, to provide professional development for faculty to improve scientific teaching, training, and productivity. Third, to build capacity for improved science education and research training in a sustainable way. And fourth, to gather evidence on SF Build's approach and practices as a model for raising the level of participation and success for underrepresented students in science. Through SF Build, our professors in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, psychology, geography, and environment, and other fields are working to upend the presuppositions that members of underrepresented communities may not have the aptitude or the background to excel in the sciences. And by reducing stereotype threat in teaching and research, SF Build has the bold goal to increase the graduation rates at the university for underrepresented students in biomedical disciplines from around 20% to 40% and ultimate, ultimately respond to the national need for a more diverse pool of researchers. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard. And thank you, President Wong. This is just one additional example of how faculty and students together change society and advance our understanding of the world around us. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Chair Kim Bell, and we are happy to answer any questions that the board members might have at this time. Thank you all for this informative update on the valuable work our faculty, staff, and students are doing on campus and in their communities. Are there any questions from the board? I have a question, yes. if I may. You know, I'm very impressed uh, looking uh, through the, the booklet that was provided as well as the PowerPoint and, and seeing all the work that's happening at the various uh, universities and the, the partnership, especially with um, 
undergrad and, and uh, President Wong, what you just described your program and the programs that exist also at um, Northridge and Long Beach. How are some of these practices then shared? Um, I know that through research, through scholarly research and conferences, you know, this work is shared. Um, but how is it shared across campuses in, in a more um, collaborative way? Um, uh, if, if you could uh, expand on that. Um, so, th so these practices, some of them are published in, in scholarly journals. In addition, we also have the Council of Chief Research Officers of the various campuses that, that get together to, to discuss and share some of these practices. We also have opportunities uh, for student research competitions. Uh, we actually host one annually uh, by the system, uh, which allows the students on campus to not only get a chance to see the kind of uh, in-depth research that they're all engaged in on their respective campuses, but to have a competitive edge to it as well in order to then advance to the system level competition. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity recently to attend, uh, but I can tell you, you'd be mega impressed uh, with the quality of the work that these students are doing and the impact that it's having on their uh, ability to move forward to into graduate or professional school and to continue this line of research as they move into their graduate work. Uh, Trustee Taylor. Yeah, good morning. Uh, question, I'm not sure, Dr. Blanchard, it's for you or for uh, our CFO, Steve Relier. What is our indirect cost recovery rate on federal grants? You know, I think it varies, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, maybe, yeah, each campus it varies, and it depends on the, also the agency that, that's funding it. Uh, perhaps we can ask well, ask one of the presidents to volunteer what might be the rate at their campus for a particular funding source. President Harrison? <laughs> so our federally negotiated rate is 45%, but in point of fact, often we don't get that amount back from the feds. It depends on the grant. In the case of the bill grant, for example, a huge portion of the funding for that is going towards student scholarships to support them as research assistants and internships. And so the indirect cost for, for I think it's 1.5 million, something like that is 8% that's going to, so it's, it's very complicated, but our across the board negotiated rate with the feds is 45%, but we don't always get it. Dr. Wong? I was, uh, Dr. Rosser to my left is on the board of SF Build. If she could, and Sue, why don't you? Sure. Uh, I would echo substantially uh, what uh, uh, President Harrison said. Uh, our negotiated rate for the feds with NIH, I believe, is a bit higher. It's 54%. But as President Harrison indicated, uh, we get much less because a good bit of the money goes for student training. So that does not count into the indirect costs for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, with NSF, we have many programs also throughout the system, and uh, there are various STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics initiatives. Again, we have the across-the-board rate, but a lot of these are training grants. So then uh, the students benefit in one way, but it takes off from the indirect costs. I, I, I would hope... Uh... And, and Lauren, I don't know if this is something for you or Mr. Reilly or Dr. Gammon. Um, as we know, historically, public universities have been largely, to be blunt, discriminated against when it comes to ICR recovery versus private universities. Uh, there's an effort on the part of public research universities to get the federal government to treat the research done at public universities on the same level as private universities. As we know, a number of private universities on the East Coast, their recovery rates are well over 60 percent. Uh, if that was the case for CSU, for the same quality research, uh, it would be an extra tens of millions of dollars in recovery for our system and unrestricted dollars. And so I would uh, like to hear, maybe not today, but at a later time, what our uh, efforts are to try to make sure that we are being treated fairly relative to our private university counterparts when it comes to indirect cost recovery. 
Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Um, Trustee Abrego and then Doug. I have a similar question as uh, Trustee Melendez. Uh, $567 million is a significant number. Our faculty and staff should be congratulated and, and their efforts to go out and, and generate these grants. With, with this significant number, though, I'm wondering, <clears throat> how do we identify those programs or those innovations or initiatives that can be duplicated on other campuses? Or because each grant will have a, a start date and an ending date. Uh, what happens to those grants? Are, are they, uh, how do we identify those efforts that are mainstream and adopted by the university? Right, so uh, there are a number, of, a number of these grants extend for three or five years. And, uh, and there are many examples where a successful grant at one university can receive a follow-on grant for another period or could be uh, considered by another campus for, for a similar program, for launch of a similar program. Um, and, um, uh, and I think, um, and there are some situations where a campus eventually becomes uneligible for a program, for example, the NIH R15s, because their funding from NIH has exceeded $6 million. And so then other campuses have the ability to pick up and build these programs further. I'd add to that that in many cases for these kinds of grants, uh, there is the push to ensure that the campuses can institutionalize some of the practices uh, so that it, there won't be as heavy of a reliance on the external dollars, especially if these are best practices that support both faculty excellence and student success. Um, and so with that, uh, you've got many instances where the campuses do continue projects, uh, especially if those that are having that level of impact that they're desiring. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you want to say something else? Dr. No, yes, right I, I think that's where we benefit from uh, uh, these efforts that, or these programs that once they're, they, uh, they end, that they, they become institutionalized. And we benefit from, from uh, our efforts in, in that area. The one, the one uh, number that's not uh, represented here is the TRIO programs. Is that part of the, the, the research money, for TRIO and Gear Up, on this uh, reported research grants? I'm, I'm almost positive that those dollars were not counted uh, in the, the chart that you see here. Uh, those are, are treated separately. Is that correct? The TRIO mm -hmm. and the federal funding dollars? Right. They're not reflected here, but you're right that that's another base of funds. That's a significant dollar right, amount that a number well. of our campuses do receive. Let me, I just want to circle back to the your first question because there was another part to that, and that is the ability for the campuses to learn from one another and to work uh, with one another. Uh, as you just heard, we've got three of our campuses that have been awarded the build grants, um, and while there uh, are some common elements uh, there has not necessarily been as much dialogue across the campuses in making sure that they're able to achieve the goals because ultimately the goal is making sure that they are able to prepare more students of color uh, to move on into graduate and professional school and more importantly to culminate with a terminal degree uh, in hand and then go on to work either in, scientific, in the scientific community. Um, and so what we're finding now is that uh, those three campuses uh, have begun to start coming together uh, and start talking about common practices and understanding better perhaps things that are working well at one campus that may not be working as well as another. I mean, it's so substantial to think that with that huge award that's been made uh, by the National Institutes on Health that three of our campuses are the beneficiaries of that, which then holds, uh, allows us to hold a real responsibility relative to the work that we're doing with students and getting them to those terminal degrees. And so they learn from each other uh, things that are working well versus those that are not. Trustee Fagan and then Trustees Nylon and Morales. So uh, Trustee Taylor exhibits a level of knowledge and expertise that uh, unfortunately is not shared by, by at least one trustee on my part. I suspect maybe a couple others. Could you, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> um, could, could, could you explain rate of recovery? Uh, the concern here is it sounds a little like we're uh, not, that we're having to kick in dollars in addition to the federal grants. I don't know if that's right or not, but give us a little tutorial. Uh, Dr. Relier, do you want to uh, 
give the overview of what ICR rates are, and then I can chime in, or uh, what the easiest I, way to I proceed. Could, yeah, I could uh, maybe just start with uh, just uh, uh, overall introduction. One, uh, when institutions, whether they're public or private uh, universities, uh, do sponsored research for the federal government, typically a budget has, you can say, two buckets. One bucket are direct costs, and these are things like salaries and equipment and lab supplies and, and other types of things. The second bucket are indirect costs, and that's usually a pre-negotiated percentage. And it recognizes that an institution has a lot of costs associated with research that aren't necessarily in that lab or in that classroom or in that faculty member's uh, office, but might have to do with the wear and tear on the facility and things like uh, utilities and, and other things, uh, things like that. Um, what Trustee Taylor brings up is a, is a very good point, and that is that that, um, that percentage that's negotiated as the indirect cost component varies widely from institution to institution. And in fact, you would be surprised how widely it varies. Mm -hmm. And I think he's also correct in, in saying that uh, private universities oftentimes are treated differently than public universities. And in, in fact, they have usually a higher indirect cost rate, even though their true indirect costs are probably about the same. There's no reason why it would be any more at a private university than a public university. I think that may have started that, you know, long ago, public universities were kind of seen as being taken care of by their states. That, of course, has changed over the years. And so uh, Trustee Taylor is correct that it, it really makes sense to look very hard at that negotiation with the federal government for the entered cost rate, because that is real money that really does help offset uh, critical costs for, for, the, for these institutions. If, if I could actually just add to Steve's comment, um, coming out of the R1 environment personally, is the negotiations that you do for these rates go into very uh, esoteric algorithms of assigned square footage dedicated solely to research versus shared with research and teaching or common space. It goes into the library holdings. It goes into the IT infrastructure. And smart campuses have figured out how to put, uh, even if it's been a state-supported building in its construction, putting more footage, if you will, into those equations to raise the number of negotiations from 48 to 49 to 50 to 60. And for a while, Harvard was at a, over 100% uh, indirect costs. And, and people think indirect costs are, not, are just sort of uh, um, uh, a fluff. They're not. They're actually real costs associated with engaging in research activities. CSU will uh, have, because of so many of our labs are also shared uh, with the instructional side compared to a Research One campus where they may have some dedicated space, our negotiations will ultimately lead to numbers that are smaller than the R1s. We have a couple campuses that are playing at the R1 level, San Diego being by far and away our most uh, highly funded uh, campus in the system. Um, but it's just important to recognize that there is there is a, a Byzantine set of algorithms that go into this calculation. It's just not getting in there and saying, Doug, what would you like? And we saying, well, it's a little high. What else would you like? And then finally, these get negotiated regionally across the country. And the, the West Coast uh, region is by far and away the most stringent uh, uh, with respect to the publics. And so we faced this when I was in the UC and we'll face it here in the CSU. The point's well taken, but I just want to sort of uh, put in perspective the context of what we might expect different here. But, you know, $5 million here, $10 million there is real money for us. So the indirect cost, I mean, when the feds give us or we get a $10 million grant, uh, do we, like on Northridge, have to pay $4.5 million or they pay us? I, I guess I'm still not quite clear on the split and what recovery costs actually mean and, and, and how it affects our, our expenditures. Yeah, I mean, typically the, the way we look at it is that, you know, the, the, the proposal will go in, it will have the, you know, the direct costs, which they'll scrutinize, but it will also have that pre-negotiated, most of the time, pre-negotiated indirect cost amount. Now, now that amount, let's say it's 45% uh, or 40% or for that, uh, that project, that, that amount will go to the institution to help defray some of these real costs that the chancellor was just uh, uh, describing. So there's there's not really a contribution, at least, I mean, you can, I, I think for a lot of these grants, there is um, 
uh, I forgot what the term is, but it's a cost sharing arrangement sometimes that makes the grant proposal more uh, competitive when there's a, a major competition going on where the institution is saying, hey, look, choose us because not only do we have the best faculty and the best students, but we're also willing to kind of chip in something here to make this a, a successful project and a, and a great project. So that will sometimes occur. It's not the, the norm, but that will, that will sometimes occur. But other than that, you're really what, you're, what, what uh, Trustee Taylor is, is addressing is that it does make sense to spend the time and effort to make sure you're absolutely maximizing the indirect cost component because that's the part that, that uh, is just overall addressing institutional costs that aren't directly attributed to that one project, but could be supporting a lot of federally sponsored projects at the same time. So when we get a dollar from the feds, some of it's indirect, some of it's direct, but it all comes to us. That's and correct. This is all about how, how it's allocated. That's right. That's correct. So we're not actually spending any more beyond that 500 million. No, I mean, we're not. I mean, now again, I, I'm saying it as if it's an absolute, in fact, oftentimes institutions will bring something to the table, which makes them even more competitive for, for this uh, proposal. Okay, Trustee Nylon and then Trustee Morales. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I think this is a very impressive discussion. I think the 567 million is very exciting. I like the concept of how it's organically grown in each of the campuses. Mm -hmm. However, as a relatively new trustee, I don't have a relativity measure. I don't know if this is going up we're going down and I don't know if we have some sort of system-wide perspective on this is where we'd like to be in three years where we'd like to be in five years and we're well on the way or we're a little behind and so I was wondering if somebody could comment on those facts um, so within the CSU uh, this number has been on average in in the range of about 580 million dollars over the last five years uh, for a few years, it was higher because we had the stimulus money from the ARA funds. But the national trend is that externally funded research is much more competitive and it's harder to get. There's a, there's a national ten, trend that's showing a decline. However, in the CSU, we have been able to hold it steady. And for the last few years, we are on, a, on an uptrend. And our, our goal is to you know, grow this. Uh, through our new initiatives and uh, through our new faculty hires um, and through a number of multi-campus initiatives and, and groups that we have. I'd, I'd add to that that for comparison's sake, that uh, comparator, comparator data typically are for individual campuses and not for systems. Um, and so it's really kind of difficult to gauge where we would be, especially being the largest system in the country, where we should be in comparison with other systems, uh, largely because of the fact that those data are more specific to the campuses. All right, Trustee Monala. Yeah, I, I wanna put a, um, emphasis, I would say, on the uh, win we have with the communities that we serve. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this type of research, uh, some of which has been highlighted here, is really important for the local communities, like in, in the areas, for example, the drought, for example, is so impactful uh, in, in uh, the research by Fresno State and, and uh, Monterey and, and some of the other CSUs that really goes deep into the, uh, um, addressing uh, a, a, an important need in the local communities. But uh, I'm more familiar with Fresno State, uh, and I can see how over the years there's been increased uh, research that is relevant to the local community. For example, in the areas of health uh, and children's health, it's really been very meaningful. And I think that's the kind of, uh, how would I say, positioning or reputation that uh, we need. I mean, when we get to um, solicit support on the local communities for uh, supporting uh, financially our, our institutions, that kind of reputation goes a long way. So, um, and then also, I mean, uh, the CSU is a resource for the local community as well. And uh, I serve on several, um, you know, community boards and in the first five commission, for example. And we see as from that uh, vantage point, we see the CSU as a resource. And I think that should be uh, common. Uh, and so uh, I just want to, uh, applaud the CSU for, for doing this. And of course that includes, you know, faculty engagement and student engagement. And just a couple of years ago, I went to visit um, 
uh, a Native American group in, in, the, in a rancheria uh, near Fresno that, you know, experiencing a lot of poverty. And they already went to one of the professor in Fresno State who's been helping uh, with research and helping the community there, the Native American community with, you know, with his knowledge and, and, and also engaging students there. So that's, I think that's the kind of um, credit that we should be getting and, and from the community. We should also think about, about that, that there's a, uh, immediately not, may not be a monetary, um, you know, benefit, but in the end, it, it will be uh, from the local community as a resource. Thank you. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo what uh, Trustee Morales just said. I mean, this kind of work that the CSU does is not known well enough. Uh, it has enormous benefits to communities, as you just expressed, uh, to our students. Um, and I, uh, I'm anxious to get this kind of work better known. And I, I love the booklet that we received but I would also like to see if it's at all possible to get this kind of information up on our website. I mean, really, this is what we are doing for the state of California and for our students, and it ought to be better known. Uh, this is, you know, the contribution our faculty makes, and it's just tremendous. And um, at one other point that I want to make, I think I know the answer to it, but we often hear about involving students in research as a high-impact practice. Um, and I'm curious to know if there has been sort of empirical studies done to show that this kind of connecting up students uh, with their university and the work of their university does in fact help them to persevere, uh, to get quicker to a degree, and to involve them more substantially in their communities. I, I hope I know the answer, but you can tell me. Um, so, so some years ago, this would have been a hard, hard or challenging question to answer uh, to prove the causality. But now there have been a number of studies uh, that have shown conclusively that there is a strong connection between the undergraduate research experience uh, and uh, success in terms of graduation and placement. For example. Uh, recently, there was a study that was conducted at the University of Texas at Austin, and they followed students from between 2006 and 2013, and they looked at those who participated in the freshman research initiative, where uh, students were exposed to research right at the freshman level, and they also had course-based course undergraduate research, and they found about uh, roughly about a 10% increase when it came to graduation rates and a 20% better chance of succeeding in STEM careers. And I think, it's, I think the jury's out on this. It's very clear that there's a strong connection uh, between the research experience uh, and, and success. And clearly, research is a tool for engagement. It's a tool that can ignite passion. And also, the discovery process is good at teaching people perseverance because that's where there are a number of failures during discovery, and the students get a chance to see how a faculty member struggles with these and eventually succeeds. So it's a it's also a tool uh, to teach uh, perseverance, and and, um, and I think in the CSU we have a unique opportunity to show that these high impact practices are in fact scalable because we are the largest you know state university system in the country. I see that President Armstrong's hand is raised to contribute to this. Yes, briefly, uh, work that was coordinated by the Business Higher Education Forum a few years ago, Raytheon and the Office of Naval Research developed a model. And this model predicted that undergraduate research and also to a certain extent internships were very, uh, one of the best practices as far as moving students along, particularly in STEM, uh, reducing the achievement gap, uh, increasing graduation rates. So it's one of the high it's one of the high impact practices, especially in STEM. Uh, okay, uh, Chancellor, did you have another comment? No. Um, then uh, Trustee uh, Carney, and then Trustee. Norton. Thank you. Just to follow up to Chair Eisen's um, questions and comments, how many students, undergraduate and graduate, are involved in this research? Um, so, you know, we, in the CSU, we'd have to get back to you with the number, but however, 
we've, we have students working with faculty in the research labs, but we also have a large number of students who are involved in these uh, undergraduate research immersion programs, uh, you know, and such as the build programs that focus on underserved students. And if we include all of these, it's, it's a reasonably large number. So in essence, we don't have the actual number, uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, that is part of our data collection process that we're working on now uh, to get more concrete information, especially in terms of the percentage of students that are engaged. You know, we, we see it anecdotally when we um, uh, do campus visits, as I'm sure that you have seen as well, and how impressive it is, but there are so many varied aspects to undergraduate research uh, that we want to have a more comprehensive approach and better understanding how many students are actually engaged and then more importantly to track those students just as some of these other campuses have done to determine whether or not they are persisting graduating and going on into graduate or professional studies. So we'll be back with Thanks. that information. Trustee Norton. This is not empirical but it is anecdotal. Um, some months ago, I had an opportunity to visit the Romberg Research Station, which is located on the shores of San Francisco Bay and is a part of San Francisco State. There I met a graduating senior who had just returned from a national conference where he had presented a paper on his own research. And while at the conference, he met uh, graduate students from another university system here in California uh, who were utterly astonished that he had an opportunity to engage in that high level of research that he did as an undergraduate. So going back to the high impact practices notion, his energy and enthusiasm as a result of his opportunities was evident. Okay, um, if there are no more questions. All right, Chancellor. Uh, thank you, Trustee Kimball. Um, I'd like to put a, a higher order perspective on this, uh, in part because I think we've touched on so many pieces that may get lost, but then also I think into a segue into the next presentation on graduation. Um, John, you asked the question about uh, how much is enough and what trajectory we're on. Uh, I think it's really important. There's two caveats here. One is that... Um, we used extramural funding as a proxy for research and creative activity, but it doesn't by any means cover the waterfront. Folks who work in uh, some of the social sciences, liberal arts, uh, business schools, there just isn't meaningful. Uh, occasionally you'll get something from the National Endowment of the Arts, but it's much rarer. So, so we have to al always recognize that that dollar amount is not a proxy for the totality of our faculty's contributions and, and, and engagement. And secondly, to put it in perspective, we're, you know, 500 to 600 million a year. Uh, UCLA as one campus is a billion dollars a year, year in and year out. But they have, you know, large, you know, 390 research centers dedicated only to research, et cetera, to give it in context. But I think the big arc here is, is why is the research so integral to the California State University? Uh, or are we trying to just sort of do what others do? And the answer, I think, is the fact that we integrate this into our number one task, which is to bring in students across the mosaic, the spectrum of society, and engage them in a micro community. It could be in a performing arts theater, it could be in a ceramic studio, it could be in a wet lab, it could be in a dry lab, it could be out in the fields, literally or figuratively, to engage them in that kind of an environment, which gets back to this issue of best practices or high impact practices, sort of inside baseball, but it really is validating a student's ability to be part of something different that then leads to success whether you come from the mainstream or come from the margins of society. Now that is different than the Research One environment. The Research One environment often will, in the old days, use graduate students. They become too expensive. <laughs> and so now you go out and hire postdocs to get your research done so you can get more publications and renew your research. So I think the real unique aspect of the California State University's engagement across the 23 campuses is this issue of integrating it with our students' learning environment in such a way that um, they benefit, the faculty benefit, and society to 
Ugo's point, this is research. Occasionally it is um, focused on basic science questions and cardiovascular health or membrane transportation, but more often than not, it's dealing with water use in the fields or uh, English learning for, for non-English speakers in an inner, inner city applied to society's problems here and now, not sometime in the future. They, they all matter, but directed research uh, matters more to the, to the state in, in real time than perhaps some of the basic research. I also want to point out that um, when you leave the university with a degree, you need to be able to manage ambiguity in life, in personal life and in professional life and in <laughs> the social issues of our times. And, and research and creative activity creates those skills and experiences, knowledge, and professional disposition to be, f to be comfortable when you can't connect the dots and to stay with it. So that's a really important thing for an educated society. I also come from an environment before joining CSU uh, and, and now having been on the campuses and talking to faculty and the students is our undergraduate students will ask a research question somewhat with reckless abandon. I mean, they're so early in their learning, they don't know this is a quote, dumb question, right? Uh, whereas if you have a postdoc who's worried about getting that job at a research university is gonna be a pressure to do more conservative question hypothesis testing in order to get a, an experiment in the case of a wet lab uh, published and into, into the Journal of Science so they're gonna get that job. Our students, at Fullerton, I met with the students who were dealing with the issue of, of the black holes last year. And to a person, they said, we asked some questions and the faculty said, wow, you know, these are faculty from very prestigious research universities around the country on the Fullerton campus. And just one example, and they said, you know, because of uh, Jose's question, we started thinking about black holes in a totally different way. And we actually now have contributed to the world's understanding of how they came about because Jose's naivete, not in a pejorative sense, but in a magical sense, right? Um, and finally, I think the faculty benefit by having undergraduates in their lab in ways that you don't have necessarily with students further along, not to be at all dismissive of the role of graduate students in research and creative activity, but there's something magical when they're a first or second year student. And that's, that is our unique niche. And the R1s can't do that. We can, and we're gonna grow this and we're gonna celebrate it more. And so to Ganesh and Lauren, thank you for f shining a flashlight on this. Uh, this is just the beginning. All right, thank you, Chancellor. Um, Madam Chair, before you move forward, can I just quickly say two things? One is that uh, a, a special debt of gratitude to the gentleman sitting to my le left, Dr. Ganesh Raman, uh, who is two months in. So he's new to all of you as our new Assistant Vice Chancellor uh, for research and has been just a wonderful and quick study on all of the work that's being done here at the CSU. I'd be remiss, however, if I didn't give special acknowledgement to his predecessor, uh, Dr. Zed Mason, who was very instrumental and passionate about making sure that we are for the first time being able to capture the research, scholarly, and creative productivity of our faculty and students in this publication. If you, I, I encourage you highly, to thumb through it, read it very carefully. It's first rate, and what a great compliment to the California State University system. President Harrison? Yes, I'll be brief. I just wanna say in response to Trustee Carney's questions about numbers, on our campus of approximately 40,000 students, we have 2,000 who are actually engaged with research or creative activity with some of our faculty. A thousand of those students are on paid stipends, which of course we want to increase the numbers overall that are involved because it's a high impact practice. Uh, but that, that's the approximate number for our campus. And then finally, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that when you speak of the contributions of our faculty, Nature Journal just has a ranking talking about the rising stars in science. And of the top 25 institutions in North America, the number one was Stanford and the number 24 was Cal State Northridge. We, have, we were the only California, public California university included. There were no UCs on that list. So our faculty are doing incredible, outstanding, very high impactful work and our students are benefiting from it. Thank you. 
Thank you and congratulations on that. Um, if Are there any more questions or comments? So, okay, seeing none, uh, we will then move on to item two, which is an action item regarding the graduation initiative 2025. The item will be presented by Dr. Blanchard, Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, and Jeff Gold, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Success Initiatives, Research and Innovation. Thank you. Again, thank you, Chair Kimbell. Today's report on the CSU Graduation Initiative 2025 will focus on the progress that we have made establishing more ambitious student completion and equity targets that will meet the future workforce needs of the state of California. These targets will continue the CSU on a path to become the flagship public comprehensive university system in the nation in terms of completion rates and equity. As we begin this discussion this morning, we must acknowledge the significant work of our campuses in achieving the outcomes of the first phase of the graduation initiative. While this work began in earnest in 2009 with the launch of the first initiative, it is rooted in the very mission of the California State University. As we shared during the January 2016 Board of Trustees meeting, the CSU exceeded its original completion goals set in 2009, achieving an 11 percentage point improvement for first time full time freshmen. Today, we will focus on ongoing work to establish and achieve our new graduation rate and equity goals. To begin, I would like to provide some context by outlining the CSU's approach to this phase of the graduation initiative, as well as those elements included in the 2016 state budget trailer bill. Both strategies seek to set more ambitious graduation rate targets for CSU campuses and the system. The budget bill requirements are narrower and focus exclusively on four-year freshman and two-year transfer completion rates, while the CSU targets also include six-year freshman and four-year transfer completion goals. Both are determined to eliminate achievement gaps by 2025. And while both approaches underscore the need for student success plans to guide these efforts, the CSU framework includes an extensive and consultative planning process to make sure leadership can involve the entire campus. Given the abbreviated time frame and the desire to include a wide variety of stakeholders, the CSU brought together an advisory committee from across the system, including a dedicated group of students and faculty working together with trustees, presidents, and academic and student affairs professionals. I'd like to again take a moment to thank a few people around the room for serving in, in, on this committee, including Trustee Lillian Kimbell, Trustee Peter Taylor, Academic Senate Chair Christine Miller, CSSA President David Lopez, President Karen Haynes, and President Lisa Rosbacher. As we presented during the July meeting, the committee established several key principles to guide the work of the committee. At the foundation, the revised CSU goals must be, must be ambitious and challenging, yet realistic. We must also maintain the academic rigor and the depth of experience that prepare our graduates to be successful throughout their careers and their lives. And underpinning all of the goals developed is a commitment to provide access to opportunity for every community in California and to meet our students wherever they are as individuals. Finally, the committee acknowledged that the development of goals also necessitates consideration of the resources necessary to achieve them. For background, more background on our process, I'd like to turn now to Jeff Gold, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Success, Strategic Initiatives, Research, and Innovation. Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard. Throughout the summer, the advisory committee reviewed several publications to get a better understanding of the state's projected shortfall in college graduates. The committee also analyzed national graduation rate averages 
and engaged with researchers to deepen their understanding of higher education graduation rate averages. Their process was also mindful of the commitment to eliminate all achievement gaps. Ultimately, the committee decided upon a goal setting methodology that relies on peer comparator universities for each CSU campus as the basis for establishing ambitious yet realistic goals. To facilitate this work, Chancellor's Office staff created the online tool shown on the slide. Based on information from the Education Trust with data from over 2000 baccalaureate and master's institutions throughout the nation. The website presents a variety of university characteristics, including the ethnic profile, socioeconomic status, and academic preparation levels of each institution's students. Using this information, the site identifies 10 to 15 peer institutions for each CSU campus. The advisory committee recommended the use of this peer benchmarking data to determine the CSU's 2025 freshman completion goals. Now the newly established goals were quite ambitious, presenting each campus with targets that seek to drastically improve degree completion. To help provide a sense of the magnitude of improvement, let's take a look at the current ranges of CSU campus graduation rates, which will be shown in blue, and the new 2025 targets, which will be displayed in red. The percentages indicate the span between CSU campuses with the lowest and the highest completion rates. With regards to six-year freshman graduation rates, the current campus range is between 35% and 76%. These ranges correlate to the diversity among our 23 campuses with regards to students and communities served. The 2025 target range, as seen in the red bar, is significantly higher from 55% to 92%. We see similar patterns when looking at improvements in four-year freshman graduation rates, as well as the four-year and two-year transfer graduation rates shown. The right side of the chart shows the same comparison for our achievement gap goals. We seek to completely eliminate all equity gaps for underrepresented minorities and for our Pell eligible students. As these charts show, the 23 CSU campuses are united in a collective effort to make dramatic improvements in student success. And this brings us to the most significant portion of our update. And for that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Blanchard. So today we present to the board the new system-wide graduation initiative 2025 targets, which were ultimately derived by rolling up the ambitious graduation rate goals for all 23 campuses. Starting from the left, we see the following system-wide goals for graduation rates a 40% four-year freshman graduation rate goal, a 70% six-year freshman graduation rate goal, a 45% two-year transfer graduation rate goal, and an 85% four-year transfer graduation rate goal. These goals are consistent with the Chancellor's vision that we will eliminate achievement gaps throughout the California State University. And they challenge us to more than double the CSU's current four-year graduation rate in 10 years. With these ambitious goals comes the opportunity to, to fulfill the imperative to serve each of our students better and to increase the opportunity to complete a college education. We must say that the state of California will greatly benefit from these ambitious efforts as well. By achieving these targets and with sufficient new state investment to steadily grow our enrollment, the CSU will be on track to graduate an additional half a million students, positioning, positioning us not only to meet the CSU's share of the projected need, but to exceed it. At the same time, the CSU will have realized more of our potential as a driver of social equity, giving every Californian the same chance at upward mobility, regardless of their background. And we will also need the ongoing support of our partners in school districts and community colleges across the state of California. 
but we do not want to in any way underestimate the challenge we set for ourselves with these goals. The CSU is considered a public comprehensive university system defined by its focus on undergraduate and master's students and by the fact that it typically accepts large numbers of working adults and commuter students. Only a very small number of public comprehensive institutions have achieved rates at these levels. And none, I say none, have done so with the students of our income profile, our academic preparation, nor our scale. Meeting these goals would essentially set a new standard in higher education, making the California State University the national flagship for public comprehensive universities with regards to completion rates and equity. I turn it back over now to Jeff. In the meantime, we have some shorter term work to do. We have asked our campuses to help us meet the required timeline by identifying the barriers they will address immediately. Upon approval by the board and acceptance by the state, a one-time allocation of $35 million will be made to improve our two-year transfer and four-year freshman graduation rates. We welcome the call to quick action, but we also know that student success means more than just time to degree. It also requires an institutional commitment to equity, to high quality educational experiences, and to completion for all students even the ones who cannot manage continuous full-time enrollment. Next, we will engage in a longer-term consultative planning process that will set us on a trajectory not just for the next month, but for the next decade. These plans will articulate the need for sustained funding to support our student success efforts. It's very clear that significant resources will be required to augment existing investments in student success. At a minimum, a greater number of our students must complete more units every term. To estimate the resources required to achieve these new goals, we examine three approaches to determine the costs. First, we applied the same methodology that was used to set our graduation rate goals by examining the CSU peer universities to see the level of resources needed to support their students. We found that on average, they invest approximately $1,500 more per student per year, which would equate to more than $500 million above CSU resources per year when applied to undergraduate enrollments in the CSU today. Second, we analyzed historical CSU expenditures and considered the costs of increasing average unit load, strengthening campus advisement, and augmenting academic and student services. Our preliminary estimates suggest that using this approach, these efforts would require an additional $425 million in ongoing funding. And third, we are currently in the process of consulting the campus student success plans to take into account the resources and expenditures that the campuses have identified as essential to help them meet their new targets. When taken all together, we estimate that we will need between 400 and $500 million in ongoing baseline funding to fulfill the graduation initiative goals in 2025. We hope to begin to approach this level of support through gradual sustained annual increases in student success funding. In today's budget and finance committee, you will see that we are requesting an initial investment in baseline funding to support the graduation initiative beginning with the 2017-2018 academic year. In return for this investment, the CSU commits to continue to bring the best minds together to seek creative ways to eliminate impediments to degree completion. In the coming academic year and beyond, we will report to the board on new system-wide efforts to bring high quality learning and improve completion rates to students from all backgrounds. This will include improving our enrollment and man uh, excuse me, our enrollment management strategies to ensure that students get the courses they need when they need them promoting the expanded use of customized guided pathways and electronic advising tools, faculty-led examinations of the curriculum, and rethinking math pathways and quantitative reasoning requirements, an area in which the Academic Senate has already taken great leadership. These efforts show promise to discover and mitigate systemic roadblocks to our students' success. Dr. Blanchard? 
So as you can see, it has been an extremely busy and productive summer as we have now reached the point of delivering these new goals and plans to the board for your consideration. But before we end, I remind you of the symposium that convenes at the end of this board meeting. We invite the board members to join us at the Graduation Initiative Student Success Symposium, which will be our opportunity to showcase effective strategies from across our campuses. The Graduation Initiative has been guided by a belief that our universities learn better from each other and that the CSU is itself a networked community of practice. Conferences like this one will epitomize our real strength as a system. There is no greater work in our minds in which we should be focused or in which we should be involved than the success of each and every one of our students. The effort to deliver these ambitious new goals and plans to the board has been an exemplary model of shared leadership and shared governance. Before we conclude, I would like to offer Trustee Peter Taylor, one of our two board members who served on the Graduation Initiative Advisory Committee, to now share brief remarks. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard. Uh, Trustee Campbell and I uh, had the pleasure of being heavily involved this summer, hanging out here a lot, uh, or on conference calls, uh, on this graduation initiative. Um, you know, a couple of impressions. I hope uh, all of you wrote down that website address, um, www.calstate.edu forward slash CSU peers. Um, I, I think it's really an interesting and engaging example of how you can use data to drive good decision making. Um, so I hope you go and check it out Obviously not right now because I'm speaking, but um, <laughs> a little later uh, in your spare time this evening, uh, do check it out because you can kind of play with it and see where we rank relative to uh, similar schools around the country. And I think that's kind of analysis that can give us reassurance that, in fact, the goals we're suggesting here are audacious and ambitious. Uh, we're not setting the bar low. We're setting the bar high. And we're really going to be working hard to make very substantial differences vis-a-vis -vis our current uh, graduation rates. And so I hope you will take an opportunity to do that. And also, can you put the slides back up? Is that possible? Because I want you to go to back a couple of a couple of slides from from We're the working end. on that now. Um, because uh, if you go back a couple of slides from the end, uh, the one that says serving students differently, to me, that's the one that oh, you just passed it. Go for it. Yeah, right there. Um, that's the one that long term will make the major impact in terms of driving these graduation numbers upward. Uh, in the short term, we can do lots of things, uh, summer bridge programs, other kinds of things that don't need a lot of uh, time and preparation to, to put in place. But changing the way we do an enrollment management, advising uh, curriculum changes, the math pathways program, I'm very excited about it, I could talk about it for hours. Uh, those are the kinds of things that long term, I think, are going to help drive these, these, these rates upward. And I'm glad to see that uh, the CSU leadership is committed to make those kinds of things happen. Um, the one closing comment I would, I would say, I think it was quite clear as we were going through our discussions that um, it's going to take a fair amount of money to make this happen. Um, it's it's uh, well more than $35 million that the governor and legislature have set aside for this. Uh, and so we will need to be in a position to, uh, together, uh, communicate the magnitude of our ambition to our uh, colleagues and friends in Sacramento to make sure that uh, all of us working together can see to it. We've got the financial resources necessary to do this, uh, not just in the current fiscal year, but in the years ahead. So uh, enjoyed being on the committee and uh, I'm pleased with where we ended up uh, with ambitious, uh, uh, ambitious goals and uh, the realization that we need more financial resources to make them happen. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, I also wanted to thank my fellow members on the Graduation Initiative Committee, uh, particularly our fearless leader, Dr. Blanchard, and uh, just a shout out always, I think, to uh, President Rossbacher, who travels, makes that long and arduous tr journey from Humboldt. So thank you very much. Um, and as Peter said, while the rest of you were hopefully enjoying your summer vacations, uh, we were enjoying algorithms for establishing benchmarking methodologies and strategies. It was a different kind of fun. Um, and I hope you're all as excited as we are to learn about the best practices and strategies that I think will propel the CSU grad rate to new heights and propel our students 
to good jobs and rewarding careers, which is what we're here for. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. And uh, thank you, Dr. Blanchard. This concludes our report and we're open to any comments and our questions. And I have a feeling there's gonna be a few. All right, uh, I start, uh, Trustee Farrar first. Um, wow, a very, very impressive and, you know, just to echo the appreciation I, that that's a lot of work with the committee members and the trustees. And um, I, being serving on this board a long time, I was so imp happy to, to, to see this uh, initiative go forward, especially, and uh, Trustee Taylor referred to it about setting the bar high. We do have a different kind of student, as we know, we know all the the stats, you know, working full time, this and that, but it, it is very important. Um, it always reminds me that we have higher expectations to increase performance, especially saying all backgrounds should be graduating at a similar rate. Um, it, it's not that we're not, it was a different type of counseling and, and aid and help, but it also reminds me very much when we say, well, our students can't graduate in four years. It's just, you know, it's too much and, or, you know, the rates, it's, it's like the Rosenthal effect in uh, academic research where they uh, told teachers, it's a very old study, uh, that their students were gifted and they all of a sudden started all performing mm -hmm. gifted too. So it's, it's this, to me, it's the same kind of, um, expectation it's it's not that we're saying you know four years are out we don't care how busy you are but that it, it, it we're going to provide the support and the finance to 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 do this and it's just very impressive that we did set the buy bar high and I just appreciate all, all the hard work on this thank you um, trustee Fagan This is really impressive, and uh, it raises all sorts of interesting questions uh, that uh, I'd like to ask. Um, the, the first question that I think we need to ask, uh, I, you may not have an answer to it, uh, is uh, what happens if you don't uh, make the 40%, and are there benchmarks along the way to see whether it's going to be possible and what happens if they are made and what happens if they're not? So why don't I, I have some more questions after that. Why don't I start that one so I don't forget because it's a great question and one that we've given a lot of thought to. So in addition to spending our time with our sleeves rolled up and algorithms, as Trustee Kimbell mentioned, we also started to think a little bit about the planning process that's going to guide us through that we mentioned in the slides as well. Uh, we're very aware that there's going to need to be a very deliberative strategic planning process. The one represented by the plans that you have was fairly rushed to meet some requirements. But uh, beginning after this meeting, we're going to engage with the campuses in a very consultative way uh, to really look through the answer to your question. So absolutely, on at the very least, a yearly basis, we will have metrics. We will have a set of indicators that will tell us uh, submetrics, how we're doing uh, across the board in terms of our progress. And we will develop new relationships with the campuses, providing leadership and support so that we're not only tracking in that fashion and, and just the accountability fashion, but we're working together to help them to get the support they need to learn from one another and to cross collaborate uh, to the best of our abilities. And I, I take it we'll be uh, the first to know on the report each year about what uh, how we're doing. You got it. Absolutely. Um, so when you talk about 500,000 uh, additional graduates, is that over the 10-year period or each year or what? It, it, it's the, Ed, Ed, did you want to talk about that? Um, turn the mic on. Between now and uh, 2030, we anticipate about 1.3 million uh, baccalaureate recipients. Uh, with the graduation initiative going forward, if we were to achieve the goals, we'd probably add another 500 to that uh, or about 1.8 million uh, additional degrees between now and 2030. So we all know and have heard extensive reports about the benefits to the state and the benefits to the students themselves and to the system of uh, having these four-year graduation rates uh, in such better shape. 
there's, uh, you know, we've also heard that there's something like 25,000 students who are otherwise qualified kept out each year because we don't have room. So I'm assuming that by the increasing the four-year graduation rates, that 25,000 is going to decrease. Do you have an idea about, you know, is it going to go away or what? Yeah, it's a great question. And part of the answer to that will be not just the throughput, so not just graduating them quicker, but the total units that they complete on completion, which we're also focused on. So in other words, if we have the same students taking the same amount of units, uh, uh, graduating a little quicker, we're still using those units, if that makes sense. And if we, if we also at the same time, not just look at the time to degree, but look at the efficiency, looking at the number of units they take, um, so that they take as close to 120 units, realizing very well in our last meeting, a couple of the trustees mentioned, we need to have some exploration of majors, some room to be able to um, find who you are and find what you want to be. But if we're able to make some progress on lowering those numbers, that directly will allow us to add new seats at no additional cost. And, and finally, um, there's excitement in the room and there's really optimism and uh, well-deserved. It's uh, obviously a lot of work. I congratulate our two trustees for their uh, volunteering. And uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, I don't want to say skepticism, but caution in the presentation. And that, you know, this is a bar set high and uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it to make it succeed. Uh, what's the confidence level and uh, how do you feel about this? Is it real? Uh, Trustee Fagan, I think we are uh, ambitious and optimistic realists. And I think you would want nothing less from the leadership of the campuses and the chancellor's office. We really do have uh, four partners having to come together to succeed. Partner number one will be the state of California to the point that Trustee Taylor made and others have made and you'll hear in a moment in our finance presentation is California bears a responsibility to use public dollars to support public higher education for the public good. And so that's gonna be an obligation for the state. We also hold um, the K through 14 system to a standard of, of working to make sure the students when they get to our doors are more fully prepared to succeed in our Ivy halls and walls. So the common uh, core standards, the associate degree for transfer, all of those things are gonna come together to make sure that we can decrease the amount of developmental courses we are responsible for when our students get to us. And some new ideas of, you know, sort of cross enrolling and dual enrolling and a whole bunch of things that'll come to play to magnify that. Uh, the third responsibility is ours, to, to, um, to wisely invest our resources in things that matter and stop investing them in things that don't matter when we find them, which is rare now. We've cut a lot of fat <laughs> uh, over the years. Uh, to think of how we manage the inventory of our courses differently to meet student need and demand. Just like a Home Depot knows when you sell a two by four, um, we know when there's gonna be a bolus of students needing accounting. If we, if we you talk about enrollment management, it's really course management as well as enrolling students to meet the capacities we have. And the final partner is gonna be students and their families themselves. That in their reality, that they have to focus on being prepared when they get here and to, to work hard at the courses they're able to take while they're with us. And if those four things come together, uh, we will, let me rephrase this, when those four come together, we will achieve this. But it's gonna require a, a game change in a lot of quarters, some of which we control directly, and the rest of which we control by influencing the good folks in Sacramento and in the K through 14 and the families through all our outreach efforts. So I think that's really the partnership that will lead California's future. People can do economics. They could look at 500,000 more grads and they could figure out, you know, those people are gonna earn a million dollars more per year in their lifetime of work and what's the taxes that California will benefit over their lifetime. And there's a whole bunch of economic stories that will get done here that make this a pervasive case, a persuasive case, that this is an investment in California's future. So, you know, we're, 
we are uh, much more confident than we are cautious, but we're not reckless about what it's going to take to get it done. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of words in, in echoing what uh, Trustee Farrar said about the study. I think it's, I'm paraphrasing it, but I, I don't remember. Somebody said it more eloquently, but um, I know we have to meet our students where they are, and a lot of our students are particularly low income, working, have families. But I do think the quote, I can't remember, something about the insidious prejudice of low expectations, and I think we have to be very careful about that. Um, uh, one of our committee members, Lynn Mahoney, at the first meeting said, "This the grad rate issue is an issue of social justice. If our students are hanging around, they're not graduating, they're accumulating debt or not working, not going on to those good paying jobs and careers, that is hurting them and their families and the state. Um, so I, I think we need to recognize who our students are, but know that they can do better and we can do better. So thank you. Um, and now uh, could we hear from Trustee Melendez? Oh, and, and then like to go before me. I, you totally pass. Okay. And then I, Trustee I will Day. be very quick. I, I just wanted also to echo uh, everyone, every trustee's uh, thoughts and, and chancellor's uh, yours as well, and thank the advisory committee for their time. I was very impressed by the um, the guiding principles that were established in addition to to the, the targets, uh, very ambitious, impressive. And chancellor, I was impressed with your outline of, of the theory of action, how you plan to uh, work with the presidents to achieve this uh, for our students. I was also impressed, even, and you know, I, I hear high levels of accountability, but I also am hearing high <laughs> levels of support, you know, to the campuses. You know, I, I had an opportunity to, to briefly, I did print out the, the plans that, that the president submitted, and, and I know you said it was uh, initial plans and, and they were done for a deadline, but you know, some of them are very, very impressive. And, and there's a lot of work and a lot of thought that is being put in this. So I am very optimistic uh, that uh, this will all come together and we will make a difference uh, and ensure that the students that attend CSU are successful, graduate on time, and become productive citizens. Thank you. Trustee Day, no? Uh, our, so our newest trustee, Trustee Parker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as a newly appointed student trustee, I wanted to take some time to appreciate the work that our campus presidents have been doing and including our students into conversations of the creation of those plans. They greatly appreciate that and we're very thankful and gave a lot of great feedback towards that. Also, if you haven't had the opportunity of including those students there in those conversations, I encourage you to maybe include them in the implementation of those programs that you've proposed. So thank you for your work. Are, okay. Um... Trustee Nylon and then Trustee Stepanek. Thank you again. Um, in a wonderful presentation, and I have no doubt that the, the staff and the, the people in this room throughout the system could make this work. But as a budget guy, I'm always more pragmatic with regard to dollars. And the fact that the LAO and other people are saying that there might be a recession, mini recession, a slowdown in our economy, we may see less resources available. So when I look at the $400 million, that's new money being asked to be added to the base, and I look at those goals, I wonder if your strategy is to index those goals based on the amount of money that you receive. So if you do receive less money, the goals are, are, are then adjusted so that you don't put yourself in a position to have really great stretch goals, but no resources to, to make that happen or limited resources. So I wonder if there's been a strategy discussion about that. This is a great question, and it's not one that we haven't discussed internally. And even in the committee, we had several discussions about what we might have as, as one of the, uh, the um, advisory committee mentioned, your aspirational goals, your realistic goals, and then your worst case scenario budget goals. We opted as a committee not to do that. We are still early, obviously very early in this planning stages, and we may revisit that. I mean, we, we are now just determining the cost and we're kind of out of the chute, really excited with great initial plans and you know, we'll see where things go. I think if a year from now, if six months from now, if two years from now, 
we're seeing that the finance, financial situation is such that we can't get the resources. Uh, we may uh, call the committee back and we may have discussions that we, you know, kind of look at where we are. But for now, we're excited where we are. We're still, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still committed to what we're doing and we're not thinking about any, any rebenching anytime soon. Trustee Stepanek. Trustee Nylon touched a little bit on what I was going to also talk about, but I still would like to build on that. This is an incredible plan that we're putting together. It's, it's absolutely amazing. In some respects, it's overdue uh, to do things in terms of enrollment management, the advisement, the curriculum review. These are all much needed so we can improve the success of our students overall, but it is going to cost a lot of money. And, and I want to reiterate the fact that if we don't get the money from the state to be able to do this, please, we need to then be able to scale it back. I've seen situations in my career in the CSU where the goal goes forward even though the funding is not there. And we really have to be sensitive to this so that we're doing the best effort that we can for our students. One of the things I really want to applaud for this particular report is the fact that it is addressing more than just four-year graduation. We know there's a lot of political pressure on us for the four-year graduation rate. But we know that there are both disciplines and also just simply students because of other commitments that need the six years to be able to graduate. And I'm also really excited that for the first time we're acknowledging the existence of the community college transfer students and trying to set some goals for them too. Because in the past, they were just numbers we just didn't talk about. So that's exciting that they're being included in it. This is something, the next thing is, is something that's maybe a little bit more than, than we can immediately take on, but we really do need to work on the definition of what is a full-time versus a part-time student, because these goals are all based on the definition of a full-time student. And right now we're going by, from what I understand, federal guidelines that says for the first term that the student is enrolled, that determines how they are to be counted for their entire duration. Somehow that needs to change so that it's more realistic that it's over some time period that we're actually measuring who is full-time and who is part-time. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Or, no, all right. Um, that actually, uh, Trustee Sapanek's uh, comment just reminded me of one thing and that's the federal requirements about time to graduation. And uh, I'm always harping on this, but I, I just want to raise it again. Um, we're not, you know, somebody goes to uh, school for two years and full time and then drops out for two years and then comes back for two years. That's six years in those eyes. And in fact, he or she has been four years full time. So, uh, you know, it, it strikes me as fair that we would count that as four years and not six years. And we're getting dinged for those kinds of situations. And particularly with the socioeconomic background of a lot of our students, that happens. So there's no way to deal with that, is there? Or some way to uh, help bring that into the world of reality in this program? Yeah, there is. And we can look at that and we have looked at that. And we've also looked at something that uh, is similar, which is you start at CSU Campus A and you complete at CSU Campus B, maybe even within four years. Or we have data that you start at CSU Campus A and you finish at USC or at a UC or at another mm -hmm. school. So we have that data and we show it and we share it. But what we need to do is because we were benchmarking against peers, we had to have the rules stay the same across the board. And since we don't have that data that I just mentioned for everyone, we keep our benchmarks the way they are and then we can report on the bigger picture as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, this is an action item before the Committee on Educational Policy. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion to approve? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. The Graduation Initiative 2025 is approved. Chair Eisen, that concludes today's business of the Committee on Educational Policy. Thank you, Trustee Kimbell. Uh, Trustee Taylor, a uh, little, little late, but I would like you to convene the Committee on Finance, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Eisen. Uh, can the Committee on Finance please come to order? Uh, first order of business, we will hear public comment from those who have signed up to address the agenda items coming before the committee today. We only have one speaker request uh, from Pat Gant the president of CSU EU. Mr. Gant. Uh, 
Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Committee on Finance. I want to reiterate um, again how pleased I am to see that the trustees are considering an ongoing budget request for what the system needs, um, even though that the, the legislature did not fully fund the system as is requested this current year. Um, I'm also encouraged to see that there is a, a couple of lines addressing compensation, which is critically important for the faculty and staff that serve the system uh, because of to meet the demand of uh, the graduation initiative, you are going to need people. You're going to need highly skilled people in every position to make sure that the students get all the services and classes they need to meet that goal. And the last thing I want to give you a, a suggestion is if you pay attention to the current state budget and what was going on, there may be $400 million sitting um, around that were unallocated in the final stages of the budget. Um, the original budget that was passed by the legislature had $400 million set aside for low cost housing. The legislature and the governor could not come to an agreement on a legislative action to basically enable that funding to go forward. So it may be, be in the best interest of the system to go forward to see if there's any one-time funding to get a jump start on the uh, graduation initiative that could help you in the spring enrollment. Thank you for your time. Jan, thank you for your comments. Uh, before we proceed, members, uh, with the approval of the consent agenda, I note it has been requested that item number one pertaining to the issuance of system-wide revenue bonds to support a project at California State University, Sacramento, uh, which is an action item. Uh, we have received a request to remove that from the consent agenda for separate discussion. Would any committee member wish to remove the remaining item pertaining to lottery funds from the consent agenda for a separate discussion? Okay, not hearing uh, such a, a request. May I have a motion to approve the uh, remaining item on the consent agenda? Second. Moved by Mr. Day, seconded by Trustee Farrar. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, anybody opposed? Any abstentions? The, items li the, the, the item listed in the consent agenda uh, is approved. Let's now move to item number one, which is an action item pertaining to the issuance of the system-wide revenue bonds for the project at Cal State Sacramento. The item will be presented by Robert Eaton and Sacramento State President, Mr. Nelson. Robert. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Uh, today we have one project for which we are requesting financing through the CSU system-wide revenue bond and commercial paper program. The project is the University Union Renovation and Expansion Phase One project at the Sacramento campus. This project was approved by the board for amendment of the non-state capital outlay program in September 2015 and is being presented for schematics approval later today in the Committee on Campus Planning, Buildings and Grounds. The requested not to exceed amount for this project is $45,900,000 based upon a project budget of approximately $53 million with a student union program reserve contribution of approximately $12 million. The debt service coverage ratios for this project are good, exceeding the CSU benchmarks for both the campus and the program. I would now like to turn it over to President Nelson to say a few words about the importance of this project and its impact on student life. President Nelson. Thank you, Robert. Our goal is to graduate students in four years, six years tops. Every year we introduce 9,000 plus student, new students to our campus. Almost half of these are transfer students, transfer students who are experiencing a real university for the first time. We want all of these students transfer students and first-time freshmen to feel that they belong, to feel that they are at home, to know that they can succeed. Some say that the student union is the living room of our campus. It's where the students eat, study, meet their, their friends, fall in love, and sometimes even marry. Yes, it is the living room. People are sprawled everywhere in our student union. You have to climb over the bodies who are sometimes sleeping, but most times are writing uh, papers and studying and looking for cords and looking for electrical outlets. But rather than call the student union the living room of Sac State, I would like to believe that it is the heart of Sac State. ASI is housed in the union, the Pride Center, the Women's Resource Center, the Sac State Hornet, our student newspaper, 
the student radio station, all are housed there. Our clubs, our fraternities scramble to find space to be able to meet. Day after day, students hover waiting to find that couch, that chair, some place where they can eat, some place where they can recharge their computer or their phones. Faculty meet students for lunch at Gorditos or Mother India or Echo Grounds. The lines at Panda Express spill out into the dining room areas. 20,000 of our students go through our student union. 20,000 of our 30,000 students go through our student union every day. When the union was last renovated in 1998, we had 23,676 students. We've added 7,000 students since then. Our students deserve to have, our students have asked us to add more meeting rooms, more lounge space, chairs and tables so that they don't have to eat in the stairwells, more dining services, shorter lines, a place where they belong. We had 23 student information sessions with our students, two town halls and five open forums with our students to discuss the expansion. 77% of the students wanted more dining space. 77% of the students wanted more study space. 75% of the students wanted more meeting space. I want higher graduation rates. I want more students taking 15 units. With our Finish in Four initiative, we have seen our freshman unit load grow from just over 12 credits to 14.5 credits this year. On average, all of our students are taking one more class than they did last year. That means that they are on campus longer. That means that they are in the student union more. They need more space to hang out and to study. There isn't any more room in the library. It desperately needs renovation itself. We need to, we have to expand the student union. Even on Fridays, you have to climb over bodies in the student union. And now we're teaching on Saturdays and we've even begun teaching a Friday and Sunday class to be able to accommodate our students. I only wish it could come sooner, the student union. Uh, we want to begin construction in spring and we will finish it by 2018, but our students need it now. Until then, we'll make do, but the new building will allow us to have space for our food pantry, space for our Women's Resource Center and Pride Center, they're now combined together, space for our Dean of Students, who will be able to meet with our students and help them there. Space for our students to eat, meet, and greet. Space for our students to be part of our Hornet family. Our students have agreed to pay for what they deserve. I ask you, Board of Trustees, to help them get what they deserve so that they can graduate on time. I ask you to please pass this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, President Nelson. Chair Taylor, staff recommends approval of the financing for the project as presented in the items. That concludes our presentation and we'd be happy Thank to address Thank you, uh, President Nelson and Mr. Eaton. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the committee? Chair Eisen and then uh, uh, Trustee Fagan. Um, thank you, President Nelson. That was uh, beautifully said. I'm so glad that we took this off the consent calendar because uh, I wanted to hear uh, from the president about the importance of buildings like student union buildings to our uh, students and to the experience they have. Um, I don't think I fully understood how important uh, these kinds of, uh, you know, coming together places are. Uh, I was at Cal State Fullerton yesterday and they have renovated their student union building and it is a true, uh, I, I can't remember your description exactly, the heart. Uh, the beating heart of the institution, and you can really see uh, the connections that get made there and how important they are. Um, so thank you for that articulation. I'm totally supportive of the uh, efforts at Sac State. Great. Thank you, Chair Eisen. Trustee Fagan? Well, this is also obviously a personal injury liability issue <laughs> as we're trying to avoid tripping over bodies. <laughs> but... Uh, is yeah. this is all funded by SRBs, which means it's all user funded. Is that right? 
So there's no no operating funds, no capital funds. So I want to commend that idea. Uh, one thing I think we have learned uh, in this last discussion about the desperate need for funds, if this uh, graduation initiative for four years is going to succeed, is we need money. And uh, as the chancellor so well put it, uh, part of that is watching every penny that we spend. And so uh, in this instance, it's not money that we're spending, uh, at least directly. But I would hope that that concept is always present in our future discussions about uh, you know, various things, including uh, large multi-million dollar capital expenditures that in past days we might have more uh, easily thought were reasonable. God knows we need infrastructure improvement, we need building, we need all those things, but we have to make decisions on where the scarce dollars go, and that four-year graduation rate that was put together so well uh, is going to suck up a lot. So uh, I just want to put that red flag out there for, for future use. Very good. Uh, any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, the item uh, for, to approve the system-wide revenue bonds and related debt instruments for the project at Cal State University Sacramento is an action item before the committee. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion to approve? Okay. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstentions. The item is approved. Let's now move to item number three, an information item on planning for the 2017-18 support budget. The item will be presented by Steve Relier, our Chief Financial Officer, and Ryan Storm, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Budget. Steve, please begin. Thank you, Chair Taylor. The purpose of this item today is to provide the Board with a preliminary support budget plan for the 2017-2018 year and to solicit ideas and feedback from the Board that will be used to craft the final support budget plan. That final support budget plan will be an action item at the November 2016 board meeting. The State Department of Finance has indicated that for the 2017-18 year, we should assume approximately $157 million of new permanent funds for the CSU budget. As in past years, this is below what we believe is, necessary to, uh, is a necessary support budget to achieve the university's goals for student achievement and success. As outlined earlier in Executive Vice Chancellor Blanchard's presentation and Trustee Taylor's remarks, there is a strong relationship between funding and the ability to reach our graduation goals, and therefore the timely receipt of resources is absolutely essential. I'll now ask Assistant Vice Chancellor for Budget, Ryan Storm, to review our budget planning process and preliminary thinking about the 2017-18 support budget. Ryan. Thank you, Steve. I'll start by providing a description of the state budget process and how it relates to the university's budget process. As an overview, uh, we will go over some basic information about the support budget and discuss today's cli uh, budget climate. Lastly, we will provide a preliminary budget plan and ask for the board's comments. This budget calendar serves as a reminder of the complex state and CSU uh, budget process. The bulk of the process at the state level runs from January through June, while the trustees work to plan a budget in September and finalize the details in November. Meanwhile, the chancellor's office and the campuses are making a number of decisions before, during, and after the state budget process has wrapped up. Because we are at the beginning of this complicated and asynchronous process, it makes sense to provide some context for this discussion. First, let's place some parameters on what our task is today and in November. The incremental additions to the CSU's baseline budget will be the focus and the purpose. The finalized support budget requests with those incremental adjustments will be submitted to the governor's administration and the legislature for their consideration in their own budget discussions and deliberations. The support budget has two primary funding sources, that's state general fund and system-wide tuition. Today, the current funding ratio is about 55% from the state funds and 45% from tuition. The CSU's general fund budget is tied directly to the health and stability of the state budget. When state revenues are positive, the CSU tends to financially benefit. The reverse is also true. 
Today, as well as during the next board meeting, it is important to take stock of where the CSU stands financially. I trust that the next slide, which you saw in July, will help with that context. As you know, we have significant and serious uh, financial factors that we must manage. We also have incredibly aspirational goals for our students that require additional investments. We'll not go through all of these that you see on the screen here today, but it is important to keep these at the forefront of your mind as you consider options for 2017-18. We just took a quick look at the CSU's fiscal challenges, now a little on what to expect for the future state economy and budget. The message on the near-term economy and state budgets is, is mixed. If the state's economic expansion continues, revenues could modestly grow each of the next three years by one to 5%, according to state projections. Under these assumptions, the outlook should mean a continued modest investment in higher education by the state. However, the economy's growth that we've seen in recent years is beyond historical averages, and we are likely facing a recessionary cycle in the near future. The expectation of a downturn in economic growth in the near future may have a negative impact on the state general fund and the state's ability to further augment its recent investment in CSU. As you heard earlier in the Committee on Education Policy, uh, student success is rooted in the very mission of the CSU and our campuses exceeded the graduation rate goal set back in 2009. Building on that success, Graduation Initiative 2025 establishes more ambitious uh, student completion and equity targets to meet the future workforce and the needs of California. While state leaders have differing opinions on public policies the CSU should pursue, as well as how best to fund the CSU, today, the governor, assembly speaker, and Senate Pro Tem currently share in our continuing efforts and desire for improvements to CSU graduation rates. And you saw this slide earlier in Dr. Blanchard's presentation. It is, clear for, it is clear from these three sets of data discussed earlier that significant resources will be required to augment existing CSU investments in student success. State leaders will need to partner with us through gradual sustained annual increases in, in uh, uh, student success funding for Graduation Initiative 2025 to be as successful as we and the state plan for it to be. I'll mention again that this is the board's opportunity to comment and make suggestions on the fiscal uh, policy priorities of the university for the upcoming fiscal year. We'd very much appreciate the board's input today as we prepare a final draft of this budget plan for your consideration in November. So this slide and the next depict the preliminary plan for 2017-18. The amounts you see here are approximate and more precise dollar figures will be available in November. This first slide provides an overview of the expenditure portion of that preliminary plan. Altogether, the preliminary expenditure plan would bring annual spending for support of this issue to nearly $5.7 billion. So let's walk through each of these components. Under Graduation Initiative 2025, the CSU will continue to invest in people, programs, technologies, and strategies that have, in, have demonstrated success in improving graduation rates, shortening time to degree, and eliminating achievement gaps. Each campus has developed multi-year plans to reach their Grad Initiative 2025 goals that will require multi-year investments across the system. Over the course of this first year of the Graduation Initiative 2025, campus plan to spend at least 75 million on their local priorities with particular focus on those efforts that, that improve four-year graduation rates for first-time freshmen and two-year graduation rates for transfer students. The proposed expenditure plan uh, to support enrollment represents a 1% increase in full-time equivalent students, or FTES. This increase would allow for growth in the average unit load for continuing students in support of graduation rate goals and a steady number of students admitted and served. For planning purposes, a 1% increase in, in, in enrollment would cost approximately $40 million and would allow for growth of approximately 3,600 FTES. The first compensation line that you see on the screen has two parts. Of the 140 million shown here, uh, collective bargaining agreements and commitments to non-represented employees total an estimated 107 million of that. The rest represents 33 million of 2016-17 bargaining agreement costs that were covered by one-time funding. The preliminary plan for 17-18 converts this one-time funding to recurring funding to cover those ongoing costs. 
The second compensation line would conditionally commit $55 million of, uh, for collective bargaining units with open contracts in 1718 and our pending final agreements with collective bargaining units. This amount also includes commitment, commitments to uh, non-represented employee groups as well. So there are numerous examples on every CSU campus of uh, facility and infrastructure needs. The deferred maintenance backlog, uh, backlog will be reduced from $2.6 billion to approximately $2.0 billion once funded projects are completed. This is good progress, but unfortunately the backlog will grow by approximately $150 million per year as facilities continue to age. Under ideal bond market conditions, dedicating $10 million of recurring funds in 1718 would finance approximately $150 million of needed infrastructure projects. This would roughly keep pace with the aging infrastructure, but would not reduce that backlog. Also, the CSU continues to look to other ways to fund its infrastructure needs, as we will keep uh, the board informed on ways to do so. Later today, we will consider one way to also do that. Uh, one final point on infrastructure, while not depicted on this slide or other slides, we suggest an additional state request of $50 million of one-time funding for infrastructure priorities and $25 million of one-time cap and trade funds for greenhouse gas and energy reju reduction projects. So funds uh, will also be used to meet anticipated mandatory costs that the university must, be, must pay regardless of available <laughs> state funds. Uh, these costs include recent increases to employee benefits, operations and maintenance of newly constructed space, as well as new costs associated with state and federal wage laws. Setting aside funding for mandatory costs helps preserve the integrity of CSU programs. And altogether, the need to cover these, all of these components is $346 million. So we just looked at the costs. Here's the revenue side of this preliminary plan. Accounting for the governor's funding commitment of $157.2 million, which includes the funding plan and savings from the retooled middle-class scholarship program, and new system-wide tuition revenue linked to that 1% enrollment increase, the preliminary plan would require additional new ongoing revenues of roughly $169 million. It is clear today that we forecast a gap between revenues and expenditures for 2017-18. Our first and highest priority and commitment to close the gap is to, to be successful with an augmentation of our state appropriation. And for that effort, we will mobilize you, the trustees, as well as students, faculty, staff, business, union leaders, and friends to help make the compelling case. If we end up not being fully successful in this effort regarding our appropriation, we then will have very difficult options to consider. The difficult options include cutting expenditures by reducing programs and services, both academic and non-academic. Another difficult option would be to consider an increase in tuition. Of course, there are many permutations and combinations of these three elements between appropriations and cuts in the tuition. As fiduciaries of the CSU, it is important to keep these three elements open at this time. In order to keep all options open, we must engage a conversation with our students soon. This need comes from our values of being open and transparent. Our consultation process is, divine, uh, is defined by law and will include the underlying financial issues of expenditures and revenues, along with strategies for joint advocacy. Today, our hope is to gather your input on your spending priorities for 1718. Future meetings will focus on the revenue picture. A more detailed information item on revenue will be discussed uh, in particular at the November 2016 meeting. I turn this presentation back over to Executive Vice Chancellor Relier for final remarks. Thank you, Ryan. Our goal is that this information is useful in developing the final support request budget, uh, budget request that will be considered by the board this November. As in past years, the draft budget exceeds the state's current planned allocation, and we look forward to participating with our students, faculty, staff, board members and other stakeholders to advocate for an increased investment in the California State University by the state. The appropriate investment of resources are absolutely essential to obtain the ambitious graduation goals that are outlined in Executive Vice Chancellor Blanchard's presentation and report. We strongly feel that there is no better investment in California's future than an investment in the California State University. 
Thank you, Chair Taylor. That concludes our report, and we look forward to answering any questions. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rillier, Mr. Eaton. Um, a couple of questions to start us off, and then we'll open it up to members of, of the trustees. Um, one very short item on enrollment growth. So I wanted to make sure I understood this. Um, to add 1%, roughly, you said 3,200 students, 3,400 students, we're going to cost us $40 million, but we're only going to get $20 million back in revenue. So generally, you wouldn't execute a trade where you spend 40 to get 20. Talk about some of the logic of, of doing that. Well, I think that's part of all of these components of the support budget request. I mean, ultimately, if you're investing in any of these components, you could say that's 100% loss if you're looking at it from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. But really what the point is here is, is that each of these components is essentially you know, critical to the university going forward. Now, one of the benefits, obviously, of course, is to uh, to have some of that revenue come back to the university so that we can actually pour that back into the, the components here. So um, in terms of co uh, framing it as a kind of a, uh, a net loss or, or, or something from a business perspective, I don't think that's the, the, the most appropriate way to look at it. But nevertheless, it does help in terms of the underlying revenue side of the picture so that at least um, a part of that plan in conjunction with the money that's provided by the governor will help make this uh, plan go that much further. If the state doesn't exceed to our request, is... Uh the issue of enrollment or limiting new enrollment on the table? I mean, at some point, you can't keep adding, 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 and not getting the funding to meet the needs of the students you're putting into classrooms or squeezing into classrooms, maybe I should say. Yeah, I'll, uh, I, you know, I think if, if the state were not to provide the funding for that increase in enrollment growth, our recommendation is that we just cannot grow enrollment, that there is that net cost. A tuition does not fund... 100% of the costs of, of, of an education at CSU. So right. or should. Uh, that would be our recommendation. All right. Um, you mentioned the importance of state budget, uh, state economy. I, I would just call attention for those who didn't see it, the lead story in Sunday's LA Times about the pension crisis in the state and what it's doing to state revenues in out years. Um, when you look at the parts of the state budget that are committed through various voter enacted initiatives, the discretionary money available to places like the CSU is really quite small, and we're going to be increasingly competing with a requirement that the state adequately fund its pension system. And so the, the importance of rallying all of our stakeholders to get behind this effort is, is truly uh, critical now more than ever. And then one last thing, Steve, um, appreciate the comprehensive report to talk about how incrementally we're going to go uh, ask the state for more money and where those funds would go in terms of revenues and expenditures. Uh, I'm hoping in November we can have a more holistic view. You know, we're an institution that spends several billion dollars a year. Uh, a little bit more of a deeper dive on uh, how we expect to spend that several billion dollars in uh, fiscal 17, 18, not just the incremental addition, but the whole the whole enchilada, so to speak, would be. Uh, we will I serve think. up the whole enchilada. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. OK, open up to uh, questions from members of the committee. I have Trustee Carney and then Trustee Day. Thank you. Um, so on the $75 million for the graduation initiative 2025, this will $75 million fund the anticipated entire cost for the academic year 2017 to 2018, or is there an expectation that at least on some campuses, student success fees will be sought to be raised? I think you should look at to the $75 million as a, the, the first installment over a multi-year period in terms of the plan. I, I assume that, that this right. would be incremental over a number of years. But, um, you know, um, when, they, when there's any discussion about <laughs> and incremental raises in student success fees, that's kind of like getting an electric shock when you see that little <laughs> one sentence in the middle of a long report. <laughs> And it uh, deserves a lot of thought before that becomes something upon which reliance is placed, in my view. So I hope that what we are planning to do with this budget is to ask for the full amount from the state that we need for the graduation initiative 2025 for this, for this academic year. Yet my other question, also related to the graduation initiative, is cost efficiencies. 
I mean, of the additional 500,000 graduates, some of that will be as a result of persistence, students that don't drop out. But some of that must also be creating more spaces for students because they graduate earlier. Have we quanti I mean, surely the legislature is going to care about the, if the cost efficiencies that may be obtained from the graduation initiative. And have, have we calculated what that is? Are we ready to talk about that? We recognize that there will be cost efficiencies, but in, in addition to that, it's also within the purview or perspective of ensuring that as we are providing students the opportunity to complete at a faster time frame, that it's opening the door for more students to come right in. And so with that, uh, we can certainly talk about the efficiency side as it relates to getting students completed more, but then there'll be the costs associated with the new students that'll be coming in to fill the seats uh, of those that'll be going out in a, in a timelier manner. Right, but in effect, isn't there kind of an enrollment increase built into this concept of the, of the graduation initiative and the anticipated costs related to it? Yeah, it, you're right, there is. And, and that's how we're planning to get to the additional 500,000 students uh, to graduate within that 10 year period of time. Um, and so in terms of the, the actual savings and the dollar aspects of it, we've not actually done that work yet. Uh, we will be working very carefully with obviously our partners here with, in budget and finance to get to that. Um, but that is part of some of the work that we will be doing uh, continuously from this point on to get a better sense of what will be the actual budget implications as it relates to the efficiency side of graduating more and then also the cost side of getting more students in. Great. Well, this is all, you know, obviously the graduation initiative had to come together really quickly and it was a tremendously impressive job. But I do think that this question of the efficiencies and the kind of built-in enrollment growth inherent in these numbers is something we should try to quantify because I think that's that's a good talking point from the CSU standpoint. Absolutely. Let's go to uh, Trustee Day, then Trustee Maggie White, and then Trustee Nylon. I'd just like to thank Ryan and Steve for your presentation. There's a lot of hard work and, and effort that's going into this. It, you know, we're slowly inching here towards, as a, as a board and as a system, we're inching closer to some very difficult decisions. And as, as uh, Jean just said, uh, part of the, the, the dilemma, I think, for us is we're faced with this um, choice of enrollment growth versus graduation initiative. And your, the last presentation in this blend well together because I, I hope hope that it's not a situation of mutually assured destruction um, they're both very worthwhile uh, goals and I think you know we can make the case to the governor and the legislature that we need to to fight for both but clearly we're not in a sustainable model we, our, our revenues don't meet our expenses uh, if we're going to move forward with such ambitious and aggressive <laughs> new priorities we're going to have to be creative with finding those efficiencies but also looking at our revenue mix. So I just w want to underscore that it's going to take a lot of cooperation and collaboration with students, faculty and staff, mm -hmm. alumni, and many, many others to have that uh, coalition to make sure that whatever choices we end up having to make, we have uh, a you know, strong wind behind our back. Great. Trustee Maggie White and then. Uh... Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate having this conversation at this point in time. I also appreciate your comments, Trustee Day, and I'd like to add to them. I think what we're talking about here is really a poll between what makes us us, and that's the access, affordability, quality, and completion that we're so proud of here. And so when we talk about tuition and fees, we're taking away from that access and affordability. That's absolutely essential to the students of California that we serve. And yet, when we talk about uh, our redu possible reductions on our campuses, that takes away from the quality and the completion. That is just as important to those students that we serve. And so looking at this beautifully laid out plan, and I really appreciate all of the work that was done on this, I would argue that we actually only have one option. And that's the option of aligning as much as possible with the state to provide for the students of California. And I would say that we have delivered pretty darn beautifully on what was asked of us with the Graduation Initiative 2025. And I really look forward to seeing uh, state support 
in a uh, continued fashion rather than one-time funding in the future. And so I look forward to seeing that implemented this year. Great, Trustee Nyland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the risk of appearing parochial, I was very pleased to, to read a document a while ago about the CSU's financial stability plan and it talked about growing the university advancement. It talked about growing alumni activities. As you can imagine, if you have more and more graduates and a static base of alumni representatives, it becomes untenable to try and reach out to them and get the resources. So I was hoping that uh, you could give me some insight on how this budget is planning to fund those activities. Uh, Trustee Nyland, uh, let me make sure I understand your question. Uh, going back to the um, uh, financial sustainability report, it did outline a lot of uh, uh, strategies for increasing revenues and reducing expenditures and, uh, and been making better use of our dollars. Uh, I think you pointed out one of them, which, uh, or a couple of them, which are key, and that is uh, developing closer ties with our alumni and really uh, energizing our development activities on the campuses. Uh, I can tell you, um, and like a lot of the trustees, I've spent uh, time over the last couple of years on, our, on all 23, 23 of our campuses. And one of the things I'm very struck by is that uh, all of the presidents are taking this very seriously. And uh, the, uh, I think uh, most, if not all, of the, them are making uh, increased investments in that infrastructure in philanthropy. And I think uh, uh, if you ask the presidents, they'll tell you they spend an enormous part of their personal time in this particular area because they recognize that it is absolutely critical to the future of the university. You're, you're completely right. Uh, we can't rely on the state alone. Uh, even though this is a public university, the state has not provided the resources necessary for us to do the job we need to do, particularly as outlined by Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Blanchard. And so the, the presidents are uh, bringing on board, uh, board more staff. They're finding ways within the campus with a pretty static budget to re-prioritize uh, uh, programs and find uh, creative ways of making those investments. Um, I, I, at this stage, I, don't, I, I can't give you an example of a particular campus. If any of the presidents would like to provide an example, I'm sure they would, someone would be happy to. But uh, I can tell you they're taking this very seriously. Maybe I can, rather than getting 23 examples, uh, <laughs> nine after 12. Um, you know, uh, in the last year, there were some conversations about uh, the university system hiring uh, more MPPs and whether that was appropriate or not uh, as we came out of the recession. And a report was made to the trustees, and we'll get that back around to everybody just so it's top of mind. And one of the takeaways from that was a lot of the investments were, for example, in, in the advancement units for philanthropy, uh, gumshoe efforts on fundraising. And um, Garrett Ashley gave us a report on the aggregate uh, fundraising by the 23 campuses plus the chancellor's office and uh, was an all-time high in the history of the CSU last year. Well, there's a causal relationship to that. And I know one campus, I'll actually be joining Leroy uh, at East Bay this weekend where he's launching his first, uh, the university's first uh, comprehensive campaign. Uh, when Leroy got there, uh, he had zero people in fundraising and now has added a small but very focused and successful group that has created enough in the silent phase to now announce a comprehensive campaign. So you can take the East Bay and you can size it to each of the other 22 campuses and say that this is exactly what we're doing. And those philanthropy is supporting student scholarships, faculty research, uh, facility improvements to help the learning and research and creative environments, uh, things of that nature. It's almost all directed <laughs> towards an outcome that helps our students learn and our faculty perform. So I think we have taken this in a much more serious way. And in my annual conference with president, they all acknowledge that every time we talk about their fundraising goals, and not only dollars across the transom, but how many <coughs> alumni are donating? How come that hasn't gone up? Or wow, why did it go up so much? And can you sustain that percentage of alumni giving? Uh, so it takes time, as you know, but it is a big part of our future. Very good. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Uh, Trustee Fagan. 
So I'd like to get back to the rather subtle, quiet elephant in the room, which uh, we haven't talked about much, and that's a uh, possible tuition hike. So you are considering <coughs> including something like that in the proposal that would come to us on November? Uh, Trustee Fagan, we are uh, looking at that. As, as uh, uh, Ryan Storm mentioned, uh, given that the budget that we've got in front of you uh, exceeds what the, what the governor has outlined in his multi-year plan, we think it's prudent to uh, have all options open to us. At this point, I completely agree with, the, uh, with Trustee White that our focus should be uh, getting, making the case to the state of California, uh, working closely with our faculty, our students, our other stakeholders, and ensuring that that investment comes in. Uh, as you look over the last few years, we've had very various degrees of success with that. We've had uh, a year, not too long ago, where the state of California funded every dime of what the trustees asked for, which was close to a hundred million dollars over what uh, uh, what the governor had uh, earlier proposed. Uh, we've had other years where we've gotten a, a, a modest increment, but not nearly what the trustees were, were asking for. Um, we think this is the year to, given this, this bold initiative that Executive Vice Chancellor Blanchard has outlined, uh, radically changing, really, the, the, uh, the success of our students uh, and, and the nature of this university, that this is the year to really make a compelling case to invest in this institution. It is, in, in so many of our minds, I think it is so clear that, I mean, it's, we've said it many times, but it's absolutely clear that this is the best investment the state of California can make in its future. Not just because of the students and their families, but because this is how California is going to stay competitive in the future. It's by having a trained workforce. So we think we can, it's actually a modest investment by the state to achieve this budget. Uh, given what the, the, the state uh, has um, access and, and based on what their commitments are right now. Uh, Pat Gant provided uh, an example of, of maybe some opportunities. Uh, but I think our, our number one um, goal is to fill this gap with an investment by the state. Now, that being said, um, because there are statutory um, uh, prescriptions that say that if you are going to consider a tuition increase, for example, you need to do the following in, in a very prescribed uh, set of steps with uh, intervals of days in between. And when you back that up, that process starts fairly quickly. So in order to keep that at least as an option later uh, for the trustees to consider, we'd have to start that consultation process now. And I think even if we didn't have the statutory requirements, we'd probably still want to sit down with students and start working through a, a, some scenarios and some solutions on this because uh, the students were involved in the Sustainable Financial Task Force report we talked about earlier. They were great contributors to that. I think they, they had some great thoughts about if you're going to change the tuition model, how you should change the tuition model compared to the past um, uh, increases. Uh, so starting that process now at least keeps it open as an option but it does not in any way, I think, take us uh, away from our commitment to, to uh, make the case to the state for that. Now, one other thing I'll mention, which is in, in, in Ryan's uh, remarks as well, is that uh, we also have to look at all of our programs, look at administrative efficiencies, look at where we can, we can save money, look at the, the mix of you know, online versus in-person instruction. All those things are still have to be part of this as well. It's not just on the revenue side, it's on, on both sides of the ledger. So um, does that time frame, if we want to consider that down the road, uh, require or mean that a tuition hike proposal is, is possibly or probably or will be included in the uh, support budget proposal that we're supposed to vote on in November? You know, I think we have more time than that. I think uh, we've, we've got time where we could uh, come back in November with, we, we do have to act on the budget, first of all, in terms of the trustees' budget. And as in the past, the budget is likely to be more than what the known amount of revenue is from the, from the state, from the administration. So that we do have to act on. But what we could do in November also is we'll have the benefit of between now and then uh, sitting down with uh, the students and CSSA and others and c 
kind of working out a proposal which we could bring to the board, but as an information item, because I imagine the board is going to want to carefully consider it and then wait until perhaps January when we know a lot more about what's happening with the state of California, with, with the governor's uh, budget uh, for the next fiscal year, and then potentially, you know, depending on, again, how all these things unfold over the next few months, uh, come up with potential actions. So in November, we will be asked to uh, vote on a, a budget proposal from the trustees, and it will not include, as part of the vote, a tuition hike, although the tuition hike issue may be a separate information item. Yeah, I, that's why I see it, at least. I, I don't see a reason to uh, act quickly on a proposed uh, tuition increase in November when we will not have as much information about what's happening with the state and the potential of the state coming to uh, to our aid and making that investment as compared to, say, January, where we'll, we'll have probably a lot more information. Do you have any number in mind at this point as far as the percentage increase? You know, I, possible? I, <laughs> I don't. And I think that's one thing we do want to uh, sit down with the students and and uh, work out. You know, when this when the Sustainable Financial Task Force report was developed and then later presented to the board, there were um, there was kind of a, uh, even though it didn't have dollar amounts or percentage amounts associated with it, there was a methodology that was described, which was rather than big spikes in tuition and, you know, years of zero increases and then another big spike, that we stay in the neighborhood, let's just say, of, say, 3 to 5%, something on a much lower level, but you do it in a planned logical way that students and their families would know about ahead of time as opposed to being surprised with and that you know while it will not bring in the, the large dollars in in the short term it will set a more sustainable path going forward and it's so, also purely more it's more fair to students so that the students who just happen by the date that they were born come in on a year where there's a big spike are not disadvantaged by that. Is that the proposal or some version of it that was included in that report from the president? Yes, that was that was included in that earlier report. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, two quick things. Uh, you mentioned about having plenty of lead time for us to be able to review this. Things. Issues like a, a tuition hike, I think we really want to see an explanation of why it would be necessary and what the alternatives are. And it's uh, somewhat difficult to do that based upon just an agenda that you get as an agenda item less than 10 days prior to the meeting when you're supposed to vote. So uh, it would be very helpful to follow up on your, your suggestion. Trustee Taylor earlier had also uh, talked about the uh, expenditure side. Looking at, uh, I, he didn't say this, I'm not sure he's really thinking it, but zero-based budgeting and not just looking at the incremental in yeah. increases here mm -hmm. uh, because you know quite frankly there's uh, some thought that out of 5.7 billion dollars maybe there's some areas that don't have to be uh, uh, spent and uh, you know again we're looking at a really aggressive great graduation initiative that we're all behind and uh, we're also all behind I'm confident that the idea that the legislature and governor could and should provide us the funds to accomplish all these great things for the students of California. Um, but uh, if, if all the ideals don't work, we've got to be tough in looking at what the alternatives are. And uh, we'll be looking at that. And uh, one last thing, um, this is being presented to get a sense of, of board members and just speaking for me individually, there may be other people who want to join in that. Uh, I, I personally uh, would certainly not look to tuition hikes as a, a number one, two, or three option. Very skeptical, not impossible. At some point, maybe it has to be done, uh, but it's, uh, it's a tough sell. Okay, other comments are, uh, on this particular item from members of the trustees? All right, obviously a great deal more to come on this in November and again in January uh, with a lot of territory to cover, I think, the, the Steve, I hope you will take to heart Trustee Fagan's recommendation, um, the extent to which we can get information out to trustees a little bit further ahead of time is always, A, appreciated, and B, 
very helpful to develop a deeper understanding of some of the rationale and processes you have in mind. So uh, let's please keep that in mind. Uh, Chancellor White. Uh, Trustee Taylor, Trustee Fagan, um, at, at the risk of being too simple, um, I just want to leave the, the very complex conversations that we'll be having over the next six to eight months really at a very high level of through. There's three moving parts here. So let's forget the spreadsheets for the moment and the numbers for the moment. As we go into planning and executing the budget in, in this 17-18 in this, uh, year, we either grow our revenues, and I'm going to say these as either ors, but they're actually multiple permutations and combinations, a little bit of one and a little bit of another. Raise our, raise our resources, um, lower our expenses, um, or cut programs. And, um, and so the efficiency and effectiveness side is, are there things that we're spending today where there's no ROI and we could stop doing that and redirect that to mm -hmm. be supportive of the, of the uh, Blanchard initiative? Um, we turn every stone on that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the tuition piece is part of revenues. I agree with you that it'd be second or third. But as fiduciaries, I think we have a responsibility to keep all doors open as long as we can. And that's the reason why we will consult with students uh, really out of our value system of being open and transparent. But also there's this pesky law that requires us to do it. But we'd be doing it anyhow. We would be, I mean, it's a different age now where we talk to stakeholders directly about things that are going to affect them. But I just want to make sure that we bring back uh, to all of us for uh, a, a, a uh, the, the analytical discussion and not take things arbitrarily off the table prematurely. But there's an absolute bias and commitment to work on the appropriation side first. And I appreciated your comments, Trustee Fagan, that the governor and legislator both could and should uh, realize the importance of this and, and, uh, uh, and our responsiveness to the state's needs. Great. Well said, Chancellor. Thank you. Um, again, that was just an information item. Uh, to right, can we move on, uh, members of the committee, to item number four? It's an action item where we seek final approval for a public-private partnership project for the development of a public charter school at Cal State University, Monterey Bay. The item will be presented by Executive Vice Chancellor Steve Relier, uh, President Ochoa from CSU Monterey Bay, and Robert Eaton. Um, Steve, please begin. Thank you, Chair Taylor. This item requests the board's final approval of a public-public partnership to allow the development of a new public charter school on the California State University Monterey Bay campus. Conceptual approval was previously granted by the board in November of 2015. This partnership strengthens an existing beneficial relationship between the Monterey Bay campus and the Monterey Bay Charter School. In addition to the financial benefits of the transaction, the proposed partnership provides academic program benefits and, and provides needed services to the campus. President Eduardo Ochoa will now provide an overview of how this project advances the campus mission. President Ochoa. Thank you, Executive Vice Chancellor Aurelio. CSUMB and the Monterey Bay Charter School, or MBCS, have a 15-year history of collaboration, including shared research, service learning, and internships for CSUMB students. Due to growing space needs, MBCS intends to build a new K-8 campus. Relocating from the peninsula to a more central, easily accessed site will allow the school to better serve the entire county. MBCS is a charter school recognized by the Monterey County Office of Education. We propose to locate the MBCS on the far southeast corner of the CSUMB campus. This area is remote from the main campus. Historically and now, the site has not been a factor in planning for expansion at CSUMB. Moreover, at 18 acres, it represents a small portion of our campus footprint, which is in excess of 1,300 acres. As part of our mission to be stewards of place, hosting MBCS means that our campus will contribute significantly to improving the availability of quality public education in Monterey County. Support for K-8 education is consistent with our commitment to bright futures, the cradle to career educational partnership that we have helped initiate to improve the performance of the educational pipeline in Monterey County. This helps increase the proportion of CSU and generally college ready high school graduates and ultimately improve the educational attainment and economic vitality of California's Central Coast. 
In pursuit of that goal, MVCS serves a countywide diverse student population reflective of the region. The partnership will provide CSUMB with ground lease revenue at market rates. At times, the school will also rent CSUMB facilities for programs and special events. Our longstanding relationship will expand to provide CSUMB faculty and students even more opportunities to collaborate on projects and programs. Perhaps most important, MBCS will provide quality K through eight education for the children of CSUMB employees through priority enrollment. The Monterey County Office of Education has amended MBCS's charter, allowing for 7% enrollment preference to CSUMB employees. This will be a key component in attracting and retaining current and new employees at CSUMB. I will now hand it over to Assistant Vice Chancellor Robert Eaton to provide additional details of the transaction. Thank you, President Ochoa. The Monterey Bay Charter School project consists of developing a kindergarten through eighth grade school to accommodate 500 and stu 508 students situated on 18 acres at the southeastern portion of the campus. The project will be completed in phases with long-term development dependent upon available funding. Completion of phase one is scheduled for the second half of the 2017-2018 school year. The Monterey Bay Charter School will be, will be responsible for financing, design, construction, and management of the property during the term of the lease. The Monterey Bay Charter School plans to obtain private funds for this project and no campus or auxiliary funds will be committed to the project. In addition, the Monterey Bay Charter School will fully reimburse the campus for all costs associated with the University Police Department services and the periodic use of campus facilities. Key terms of the proposed agreement with the Monterey Bay Charter School are as follows. The campus will lease the site to the Monterey Bay Charter School for a term of 50 years with no extension options. Base rent will be $181,500 per year. Rent will start at 25% of that amount until the start of construction. Rent will then rise to 50% of base rent for the duration of construction through final occupancy, at which time it will then go to 100% of base rent. Rent payments will be escalated at the end of the fourth year based on increases in the consumer price index during those four years, and then rent will be escalated every four years thereafter based upon the same methodology. The property reverts to the campus upon expiration of the ground lease, and the campus will have at its discretion the option of accepting the improvements or having Monterey Bay Charter School return the property to its initial unimproved condition. Staff recommends approval of the project as presented. Chair Taylor, that concludes the presentation. We'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you very much, Robert, Eduardo, and Steve. The final approval for the uh, public-private partnership of the development of the charter school at CSU Monterey Bay is an action item before the Committee of Finance. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion? May I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstentions? The final approval of the public-private partnership at CSU Monterey Bay is approved. Um, next, we have two more items, members, so bear with us. We're going to continue to plow through. Item five is an information item presenting the CSU's annual investment report. Item will be uh, presented by Assistant Vice Chancellor Robert Eaton. Please begin, Robert. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Uh, this item provides the annual investment report for the fiscal year 2015-2016 for funds managed under the California State University Investment Policy. The bulk of CSU funds are invested through the CSU System-Wide Investment Fund Trust, or SWIFT, investment portfolio, which had a balance of $3.5 billion as of June 30th, 2016. The SWIFT portfolio provided a return of 1.18% during the 12 months ended June 30th, 2016, and this return was better than the benchmark for the portfolio, which is a treasury-based index. The portfolio continues to be invested in highly rated fixed income securities. However, as previously reported to the board, staff has been working with key partners in the Assembly, the Senate, the Department of Finance, and the State Treasurer's Office to change the legislation that governs the CSU's investments. Because fixed income, because fixed income securities have been generating low returns for a number of years, the goal of the legislation has been to provide the CSU with more investment options and increased earnings on the existing base of funds. This potential for additional revenues would enhance the CSU's ability to address its deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure backlog. As a result of these efforts, we have been successful in crafting legislation that meets CSU goals, as well as those expressed by our partners in Sacramento. The proposed legislation received support from the state treasurer in April. It passed unanimously in the Senate in late May and passed unanimously in the Assembly in August. And I am happy to report that the legislation was signed by the governor on September 9th and will become effective January 1st, 
2017. We will begin working with Chair Taylor on the implementation of that program. That concludes the presentation. Be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Robert. Uh, any questions for Mr. Eaton? Hearing none, uh, great news about the investment authority. Look forward to coming back to uh, members uh, either in November or January with uh, uh, some plans for taking advantage of this great authority that's been granted to us. Um, if it's all right, we'll move on to the very last item, item number six. It's an information item on debt management. I'd like to turn to uh, Steve Rollier and Robert Eaton to kick this off. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Over the course of the next of this fiscal year, the board will, he will hear a series of in-depth presentations on various financial and operational aspects of the university. With focus on the system-wide revenue bond program and its associated commercial paper and short-term debt programs, this item will present information on how the CSU manages debt and makes optimal use of its debt capacity to meet the CSU's extensive capital needs. We will also provide the board with an overview of other debt management options that are commonly utilized by other higher education public institutions to lower the cost of capital or provide financing flexibility. I'll now hand over the uh, presentation to Robert Eaton, who will present the, this item. Robert. Thank you, Executive Vice Chancellor Relier. Uh, with our extensive need for capital funding to address the CSU's deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure backlog, debt is a strategic resource. And over the years, the CSU has been very successful in prudently managing this resource to meet our capital needs and ultimately the needs of students. The starting point of this success is the board's CSU policy for financing activity, which was last updated in November of 2014 and sets forth the authorities and principles that serve as the basis for the management of debt at the CSU. And the key, provision of the, uh, key provisions of this policy are as follows. First, the policy establishes the structural principle that CSU and auxiliary projects shall be financed through a structure supported by a broad, system-wide, multi-source revenue pledge. The policy states that the long-term debt programs of the CSU shall be managed to credit rating standards in the A category at minimum. The policy provides for the prudent use of variable rate debt or commercial paper to lower the overall cost of debt. And the policy delegates authority to the chancellor to establish procedures for the implementation of debt policy and the management of debt consistent with the board's objectives for the use of debt. The mechanism by which the chancellor has established procedures for the implementation of debt policy and the management of debt is through Executive Order 994, which defines the system-wide revenue bond program and the procedures and financial standards for its use in financing capital projects. This executive order is presently under review and pending revision, primarily in response to state legislation passed in July 2014 that affected the CSU's capital financing programs and required new approaches to capital financing at the CSU. The system-wide revenue bond or SRB program was established by the CSU Board of Trustees at its March 2002 meeting. The SRB, pro the SRB program provides capital financing for projects of the CSU, student housing, parking, student union, health center, continuing education facilities, certain auxiliary projects, and other projects approved by the board, including academic facilities. Revenues from these projects and CSU operating revenues approved by the board are used to meet operational requirements for the projects and to pay debt service on the bonds issued to finance the projects. Gross revenues from these projects and gross student tuition fee revenues are pledged on a consolidated basis to the bondholders, which has resulted in strong credit ratings and low borrowing costs for the CSU. Since the inception of the SRB program, the CSU has also issued commercial paper, short-term notes with low interest rates as part of its overall debt management strategy the commercial paper is issued by the CSU Institute, a system-wide auxiliary of the CSU as a bridge financing mechanism to provide campuses with capital financing on projects until bonds are sold. And this slide provides some key characteristics of the SRB portfolio, uh, almost $5 billion in outstanding bonds. It's a very well-rated program, AA2 from Moody's and AA- minus from Standard & Poor's, both with a stable outlook. And the overall interest cost is 3.68%. And the mix mostly long-term uh, fixed rate uh, with a modest amount of short-term fixed rate. Uh, the short-term fixed rate is a result of the 250 million of three, five, and seven-year notes that we issued as part of our restructuring of State Public Works Board bonds in April. One of the natural questions that one might have is how much extra debt is the CSU able to issue, 
particularly in light of our large backlog of deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure. Debt capacity, that is the amount of debt that the CSU may issue while still maintaining or pursuing certain strategic and organizational goals can be estimated based upon a number of quantitative factors such as financial ratios or qualitative factors such as student demand. However, because of the number of variables and assumptions involved, it is important to remember that any calculation of debt capacity is only an estimate and must be managed and monitored accordingly. Based on the CSU's financial position as of June 30th, 2015, and certain forward-looking assumptions, staff estimates that the CSU has additional debt capacity of approximately 2.5 billion over the next five years. Now, this does not mean that the CSU can or should go out and immediately issue this much debt. This estimate is based upon, among other assumptions, modest levels of revenue growth and the ability to pay the debt service. In addition, a certain amount of capacity should be reserved in the event of unforeseen circumstances. However, this is a resource that can be used wisely. And in fact, later today in the Joint Committees on Finance and Campus Planning Buildings and Grounds, staff will present a plan to make use of a portion of this debt capacity to address our capital needs. As I noted earlier, I believe that the CSU has been able to prudently manage its debt for many years, and, I, and the CSU has been able to do so and yet still steadily drive down the cost of capital by issuing long-term fully amortizing fixed rate debt. This approach has served the CSU well. However, there are other debt instruments and structures that are very common and that could potentially provide greater flexibility in managing debt and lowering the CSU's risk-adjusted cost of capital even further. These options include greater use of variable or short-term debt, the issuance of long-term fixed rate interest-only debt, greater use of taxable debt. As a public agency, the CSU primarily issues tax-exempt debt, different types of call options, and even an internal loan structure, whereby the CSU establishes an internal lending rate that would be charged to all projects, and then staff manages the debt portfolio to achieve a long-term total cost of capital below the lending rate, utilizing these different instruments and structural options. The CSU has utilized some of these options on a limited basis. For example, we have issued short-term notes and we have issued taxable debt. Other options would be new to the CSU, but are used by other public higher educational institutions. All of these options have pros and cons, however, used prudently and with the same careful attention to risk return trade-offs that have served the CSU well for many years. They could potentially have value in managing our debt. Debt is a vitally important resource of the CSU and the issuance of debt to ensure that our capital facilities are safe and up to date in order to meet the needs of our students is entirely appropriate. Our purpose today has been to demonstrate to the board that the CSU debt is managed responsibly and optimally and to ensure that this strategic resource continues to be available to meet the needs of our students. Chair Taylor, that concludes the presentation and we'll be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Robert. Um, can you go back to slide six, if you don't mind? Um, I, I'm pleased to see that long list of uh, new options that we're looking at to expand our flexibility and, and uh, simultaneously save money. Uh, I notice hedging techniques aren't up there. Um, is there a reason for that? Uh, certainly it's an option. I think uh, these are probably the, the ones that we would look at first. I mean, obviously, as you're familiar with, uh, there's a lot of negative publicity surrounding the use of hedging. Uh, they can be used prudently, though, just like any of these instruments. It has pros and cons. Right. And I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the bad uh, reputation that hedging has is due to abuse. Yeah. Um, uh, but certainly it could be um, a component if we chose to do so. Well managed, it can save you a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. Um, other thing on debt capacity, uh, I'm assuming you made the assumption that we're, uh, the debt capacity is calculated on a AA rating? That's correct. The figure you see there assumes that we are maintaining our AA rating. And, and I think it's important for members of the trustees to understand it's a little bit counterintuitive. The lower your rating, the greater your debt capacity. Um, and we have a policy saying that we should manage to win a single A rating. And so uh, it's altogether possible that at some point we're going to have to struggle with what kind of investments we want to make for achieving our educational goals, our student life goals, vis-a-vis -vis our rating and vis-a-vis -vis our debt capacity. So um, I, I just want to raise this as a topic because as much as we like to pound our chest and say we have high ratings and that's great, they can also be very constraining and make it harder for us to uh, achieve our objectives in terms of providing the kind of facilities our students really need in order to pursue their, their objectives. Um, any questions from members of the trustees uh, on this particular item? 
uh, obviously a lot more to come on this uh, going forward, but uh, any questions right now? Uh, or is everybody hungry and want to go to lunch? <laughs> Trustee Carney. So in calculating the, the uh, additional debt capacity, you're including both self potentially self-supporting uh, bonds as well as bonds that would need to be paid out of operating revenue? That's correct. Uh, when I mentioned I referenced certain growth assumptions on the revenue side, that's including all revenue growth from all sources, kind of the CSU on a consolidated basis. That would include auxiliaries as well. Right. Okay. It, you know, as we go forward with this, it would be really helpful if you always separate out those numbers because obviously as trustees, we're going to be very concerned about the um, debt service obligation out of operating revenue. Right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no other questions, uh, Chair Eisen, that concludes the business of the Committee on Finance. Thank you, Trustee Taylor. We will break for lunch. We'll be back here at 1.30. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly.